views, and then we'll come back. We're so, just trying to see if this is a good position for us. Okay, so, well, I can... ready and then you just hit that button. Probably. Yeah, probably you are screwing up what she said. I'm just saying.
All right, we're going to go back on the record. State of Wisconsin, Mark D. Jensen, 2002 CF314. It is January 26, 2023. Let's have the appearances, please. Good morning, Your Honor. The State of Wisconsin appears by Special Prosecutor Robert Jamboys, Deputy District Attorney Carly McNeil, and Public Service Special Prosecutor Beverly Jamboys. Attorneys Bridget Krause, Jeremy Perry, and Mackenzie Renner appear on behalf of Mr. Mark Jensen, who appears in person. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. The uh, jury is back in the courtroom. Um, thank you for coming on time to the jurors. We're going to continue with the uh, defense's case. Who is the next witness that uh, you wish to call, Ms. Krause? Judge, I'm going to call Dr. Stacy Hale, but before um, I bring her in, I move in Exhibit 110. Any objection from the state? What's it, what's, what is it? No objection. All right, it's received. Doctor, raise your right hand. I'll swear you in. Okay. You saw me swear the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you, God. Yes. Thank you. You can get as close as you can to that microphone. You can put it down and spell your first and last name for the reporter. My name is Doctor Stacy S T A C E Y. Hail, H-A-I-L, like a hailstorm. Go ahead, Ms. Krause. Dr. Hale, what do you do for a living? I am a board-certified emergency medicine physician and a board-certified medical toxicologist. And where do you live? I live in Dallas, Texas. So last Sunday was a pretty tough day? Yes, especially if you ask my husband, Brian. And where do you work? I work at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas. And what do you do for Parkland Hospital in Dallas, Texas? Uh, I am an emergency medicine physician, and I also work as a medical toxicologist. When you say you're an emergency department physician, what does that mean? Well, that means that I take care of anybody that presents to the ER at Parkland. Parkland is the single busiest emergency department in the entire country. And it's also known for where JFK was taken when he was shot. And so when I'm wearing my attending physician hat in the ER, I am taking care of heart attacks or strokes or overdoses or trauma or snake bites, lacerations, anything that comes into the emergency department. Is Parkland Hospital a teaching hospital? It is. And who is it associated with? It is associated with the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. So do you work for Parkland Hospital or do you work for the University of Texas Southwest Medical Center? I am employed by the University of Texas Southwestern. Southwestern, and um, what do you do for the University of Texas Southwestern? I'm an associate professor. What does that mean? Well, I think a lot of people can relate to professors teaching in the traditional classroom type of setting. But in the medical setting, a lot of our teaching is actually at the bedside of a patient in the hospital. Is it similar to what um, is in Milwaukee with Freighter and the Medical College of Wisconsin? I believe so, yes. Um, so your duties at the University of Texas Southwest um, include being an associate professor? Yes. And does it also include something as it relates to Parkland Hospital? 
Yes, the faculty that are University of Texas Southwestern faculty are the, the physicians that staff Parkland. And the students that you teach, do they also work at the Parkland Hospital? Yes, the medical students, which are actually part of the university, will do rotations at Parkland. I want to talk to you about the education you needed in order to become an emergency room physician. Can you tell this jury a little bit about what that education was? I went to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, where I received my Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, followed by going to the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, Georgia, where they play the masters to get my MD degree. And then I went back to Dallas, Texas, where I did my three-year residency in emergency medicine, followed by a two-year fellowship in medical toxicology. Dr. Hill, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 111. Dr. Hill, do you recognize that document? Yes. And what is that? This is my CV. Now, when you introduced yourself and the work that you do to the jury, you said something about being board certified. Um, can you explain to us what board certified means? Yes, in order to be board certified in a certain specialty, you have to first do a residency, so that is following medical school. And then once you complete that residency, at least for emergency medicine, for me was three years, you have to pass a written test, and then you have to pass an oral board examination, and then you have to do that every 10 years with milestones along the way that you have to complete. And I think on your CV, it actually talks about your most recent um, board certification in emergency medicine. Yes, we have to renew that every 10 years. Now, I think you also said that you were board certified in medical toxicology. Yes. Explain to me how you're board certified in both emergency medicine and medical toxicology. Yes, I think that's kind of confusing for some people to grasp that. But just like a cardiologist might do a fellowship after internal medicine to specialize in hearts, or a neurologist can go on and do further specialty, or uh, a, a renal doctor can do a fellowship in kidneys, one of the fellowships that's available after emergency medicine is in medical toxicology. And toxicology is the study of poisons, but uh, as a medical toxicologist, I'm not working in a laboratory setting. A medical toxicologist specifically treats and manages poisoned patients. And because most poisonings are acute, because they're emergencies, and they frequently present to the emergency department setting, it is frequent that medical toxicologists will do an emergency medicine residency first. Now, you cannot go from medical school and do a medical toxicology fellowship. You actually have to do a residency in something first. So in order to become a medical toxicologist, you have to take um, an additional step in your education? Correct. And, and then you have to become board certified? Yes. Is board certification for medical toxicology the same as the emergency department? No, it's an additional certification, and it's a written test that you have to pass, and it's a very, very difficult test to pass. Do you have to um, renew that every 10 years, like you have to do in the uh, other certification? Yes. Now, outside of the work that you do with the university and the hospital, do you do any other work in Texas? Well, as a medical toxicologist, we work out of in Texas. Thank you, ma'am. It's okay. As a medical toxicologist, we work out of the North Texas Poison Center, which is associated with Parkland Hospital. And when you say the North Texas um, Poison Center, can you tell us what work you do for them? I think that a lot of people are familiar with poison centers, and probably in the sense like if you're a parent and your child drinks bleach under the sink or something like that, 
that um, you can call the Poison Center for advice. The Poison Center is not staffed by telephone operators. They are actually staffed by what are called spies, which stand for specialists of poison information, so they're specifically trained. And they give advice to anybody that calls requesting information about a poisoning. But I think what a lot of people don't understand is that if you call a poison center as a physician working in a region, you can actually have a consultation with a medical toxicologist such as myself over the phone. And that happens every day where healthcare personnel around the country actually call the poison center for advice on the specific management of a poisoned patient. And how often do you do that? Every other month. And as part of that program, do you also teach um, others while you're working at the Poison Control Center? Yes, every day except for Thursdays, we have what's called um, Poison Center Rounds. And we have medical students, we have emergency medicine residents that are on their toxicology rotation. We have some pediatric residents, some psychiatry residents, pharmacy students, and we even have individuals that come to train from other states. And so every morning during toxicology rounds, the cases that were called in to the Poison Center get discussed so that we can talk about how to appropriately manage these cases. And then it's followed by some classroom lectures and discussions, and it's a round table type of setting. So just so I'm clear, you're a physician for Parkland Hospital. Yes. And you're an adjunct professor for the university. An associate professor. An associate professor. You also work with the Poison Center of Texas. The North Texas Poison Center. Thank you. Um, as it relates to medical toxicology, do you do any work at the university as it relates to medical toxicology? Well, that's through the Poison Center. Now, going back to your board certifications, how many physicians are board certified in emergency medicine? Thousands. And how many um, physicians are board certified in medical toxicology? Far fewer, and don't hold me to the exact number today, but the last time I looked into it, it was somewhere over 300. And it's fair to say that some people may retire and then new people might be board certified? Yes. And that's why that number might fluctuate? Yes. Have you ever testified in court as an expert in medical toxicology before? Yes. And do you know about how many times you've testified? Uh, so on Monday, that was my 34th time to testify in federal court. And I believe this is my 15th time to testify in state court. And that's as an expert in medical toxicology? And emergency medicine. Thank you. How many um, of those cases were criminal cases? Uh, most of them. And in the criminal cases you testified, how many times have you testified for the prosecution or the federal government? Many times. Most of the time, my, my um, expert witness work is for the Department of Justice with regards to federal drug crime, and I uh, most frequently have testified for the prosecution. As a medical toxicologist, when you're retained as an expert to review a case, are you paid? Yes. And when you're an expert for the government or the prosecution, are you paid? Yes. And in this particular case, um, are you getting paid for your time? I am. And when we say getting paid for your time, what does that include? Is it just testifying? No, it is anything that I'm doing that takes time so that includes reviewing case materials, writing a report, discussing the case with attorneys, travel time, uh, testifying in court, anything that takes time pertaining to the case, including research. And that would be true in the cases you've testified for the government and the, Mr. Jensen's case? Yes. Dr. Hale, I want to go back to your um, curriculum vitae. Um, have you correct? Have you ever conducted any trainings? Yes, I have over time 
been involved in teaching assistant U.S. attorneys, FBI agents, DEA agents um, around the country, like at Quantico, Virginia, uh, tra training law enforcement officers about toxicology and drugs. And when you say training um, law enforcement officers on toxicology, toxicology and drugs, what specifically have you trained them on? Well, mainly to understand that any drug overde overdose death, that scene is a crime scene. And that the kinds of things that I, as a medical toxicologist and as a physician, would look for in rendering a toxicologic cause of death opinion and trying to help law enforcement to understand what kinds of things would be important to me because I think a lot of law for enforcement for a number of years felt like cause of death was based on just a post-mortem drug level. And there's more to it than that. And so things at the scene that are important and to gather that information uh, is part of what I teach them. And have you done that in drug cases? In drug cases, yes. Um, have you done that in any tox toxin cases, poisons? Well, I, I guess technically drugs are poisons, so fair. yes. Um, Dr. Hill, this jury heard that Dr. Mary Mainlin is a forensic patho pathologist, and you've told us that you are a medical um, toxicologist. What's the difference? Well, a forensic pathologist is specifically trained in the field of pathology. And so pathology involves looking under the microscope at different tissues and determining if something is cancerous or looking at blood smears and determining if the blood counts are normal. And then they go on to do a fellowship in being a medical examiner, and that's specifically to perform autopsies. And that is not what I do. I am not a forensic pathologist. I don't do autopsies. I manage living poisoned patients. And my job is to make sure that my patients don't meet the medical examiner. And um, do you need a forensic pathologist or medical examiner to determine a cause of death every time a patient dies? No, most of the time death certificates are, are signed by a patient's primary care physician or a nursing home physician. Any physician can render a cause of death opinion because a cause of death opinion is, after all, a medical diagnosis. However, there are certain laws around certain types of cases that require a medical examiner to perform an autopsy, but the vast majority of deaths don't require that, and everybody gets a death certificate, and it must be signed by a physician, but it's not always a medical examiner. Dr. Hill, as a um, physician in the emergency department, as well as a medical toxicologist, how many ethylene glycol poisoning patients have you treated? I knew you were going to ask me that, and I really don't have any way to give an exact number, but I would have to say over the course of my career, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20. And those patients that you have treated, do you know um, how they came to cons consume ethylene glycol? Most of them are either accidental or suicidal, and there was one that I believe was homicidal. How do you treat a patient with ethylene glycol poisoning? Do they all die? No, they don't. And how do you treat them? Well, we have a very specific antidote that is called famepazole. And I think we'll talk about this more later, but it is it is a specific antidote to treat an ethylene glycol poisoning, and then we also can treat them with hemodialysis. So as it relates to your work as a medical toxicologist, which is what you're here for today, have you testified in previous drug overdose cases? Yes. And have you testified in previous ethylene glycol poisoning cases? Yes. And do you know how many times you've testified in ethylene glycol cases? Twice before today. Dr. Hill, I want to talk to you about the work that you did in the Mark Jensen case. Okay? okay. Um, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 112. Thank you.
Dr. Hale, do you recognize that exhibit? I do. And what is that? This is my report that I prepared in this case. I want to talk to you about some of the information in the report that you prepared in this case. And one of the things I want to talk to you about is the methodology you use when you receive a case file um, and the work that you do in order to come up with um, an opinion. Can you tell us a little bit about that methodology? Well, frequently when I'm asked to review a toxicology-related case, I'm being asked a cause of death opinion. And even though I am a medical toxicologist, I am first and foremost an emergency physician. So I don't approach the, the cause of death just with toxicology blinders on. I first rule out traumatic causes of death, which is important in any death case. Secondly, looking for natural causes of death including what someone's underlying medical history is, which is, of course, important, followed by the findings on the autopsy. Thirdly, considering an arrhythmia. An arrhythmia is an abnormal heart rhythm. And once somebody dies, there's nothing you can see on autopsy that says an arrhythmia occurred. So in medicine, we call it a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning you don't find anything else on the autopsy and so looking at the circumstances may lead you to believe an arrhythmia occurred. And then finally, looking at the toxicology causes of death, which includes, of course, looking at what is in the post-mortem toxicology testing, but not hanging your hat on the exact number because you have to correlate the findings in the toxicology test post-mortem with perimortem circumstances. And do you review any um, police reports or discovery? Yes, it's important to review police reports, the obviously the autopsy report, the toxicology testing, and scene photos, and of course nowadays looking at cell phone footage, cell phone text messages, social media accounts, everything goes into that methodology. And in Mr. Jensen's case, did you review all those materials you just discussed with the jury? Minus cell phone text messages, of course. And that's included in your report, your review and your um, explanation of those things? Yes. I want to talk specifically um, about ethylene glycol. Is ethylene glycol toxic? In and of itself, it is not. And as a medical toxicologist who also teaches um, as an adjunct professor, I think you might be in the best position to teach this jury a little bit about how ethylene glycol becomes toxic. Yes. So I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to give you a my handheld microphone um, and ask you to tell us the stages in which ethylene glycol turns into a toxin. Okay. Is this working? Yes. All right. Okay, so it's first important to understand the now. This is not me being condescending. This is exactly how we teach our doctors in training at the Poison Center. So first, what I want you to understand is if you go out and have some wine or some beer later, that substance is ethanol. After you drink ethanol, an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, which I'm going to abbreviate as 
ADH, metabolizes ethanol to acetaldehyde. And then an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase which I'm going to abbreviate as ALDH, metabolizes this aldehyde to acetate, which is also known as acetic acid, which is the chemical in vinegar. Now, our bodies are specifically trained or designed to take that substance off and detoxify it through something called the Krebs cycle, which is not important, but just so you know, this is what makes ethanol not toxic to humans. Now, let's talk about ethylene glycol. Now, the reason why I underlined the OL is because that's the chemistry way of knowing that something is an alcohol. So with ethylene glycol, it must go through the enzyme ADH, alcohol dehydrogenase. And that makes a compound called glycoaldehyde. And now glycoaldehyde goes through aldehyde dehydrogenase, and it ultimately makes glycolic acid, glyoxylic acid, and oxalic acid. Now I've simplified this, but it's critical and understanding. So just as ethanol causes somebody to become drunk, that is what ethylene glycol does. Is it, because it's an alcohol, will cause you to become drunk. So when we're talking about glycolic acid Glyoxylic acid. Glyoxylic acid and oxalic acid. Why is it important to understand that ethylene glycol becomes those three acids? So what's critical to understand here is our Krebs cycle does not siphon away these acids out of our body. And so it is the accumulation of these acids in our body that make ethylene glycol to be known as a toxic alcohol. And what's even more important to understand is these are enzymes, alcohol dehydrogenase and aldehyde dehydrogenase. These are the enzymes that make ethylene glycol go from some not toxic, other than being drunk, alcohol, to something that harms our body. And so these enzymes are different in different people. Some work faster in some people, some work slower. For example, you've heard of how Asians may flush after they drink alcohol. That's because they have an issue with their aldehyde dehydrogenase so this gets stuck back here, and it accumulates, and that causes them to flush more. This is also the compound that makes somebody feel a hangover. So this is the rate determining step. If any of you ever took chemistry, even high school chemistry, you might remember the rate determining step. And so it's not like you can drink a bunch of ethylene glycol, 
and drop dead all of a sudden, or even in a short period of time, because you have to wait for this alcohol dehydrogenase to do its first step. Now people may ask, and they do, how long does that take? And the answer is, it's different in different people. Because we are all not the same. But it can take up to several hours. And so this whole process takes time, which is why ethylene glycol poisoning is not a rapid death under any stretch of the imagination. So Dr. Hale, if I took a big amount, 30, 50, 100 milliliters of ethylene glycol, I wouldn't immediately die? No. Why not? Because of these steps that have to happen, you have to wait in line as an ethylene glycol molecule for the attention of alcohol dehydrogenase to convert you to something toxic. And the interesting thing, just so you understand this concept of alcohol dehydrogenase, is in the olden days, before there was this antidote for ethylene glycol poisoning called thomepazole, we treated ethylene glycol poisoning with ethanol with the hope that it would compete for the attention of alcohol dehydrogenase. And so, believe it or not, back in the olden days, if somebody accidentally drank ethylene glycol, perfect first aid would get them to be drinking whiskey on the way to the emergency department because it competes for this molecule, this enzyme. Dr. Hale, you talked a little bit about this medication that is used to treat ethylene glycol uh, poisoning, right? Yes. And what is that called again? Femepazole. Femepazole. Is that F-O-M-E-P-I-Z-O-L-E? -E? Yes, femepazole. Works right here. We heard from Dr. Mainland that if someone gets medical intervention, it would mean that the amount of ethylene glycol in their blood would decrease. Is that consistent with the information you know? That is incorrect. And can you tell us what femepazole does as it relates to ethylene glycol poisoning and why that would be incorrect? Sure. So, as I have pointed out, this is the rate determining step for this conversion. Femepazole blocks ADH. So femepazole slows that down or blocks it. So as you can imagine, if you block this, you're keeping all of the ethylene glycol as ethylene glycol. So it is completely counterintuitive and wrong that giving femepazole decreases the ethylene glycol level. It actually makes the ethylene glycol stick around longer. In fact, if you went out to drink at a bar and you happened to take femepazole before you went, you would stay intoxicated a lot longer because the ethanol would stick around a lot longer. Now that would be a very expensive night because femepazole can be $1,000 to $2,000 a vial but still, so if femepazole works here at the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme, it keeps ethylene glycol as ethylene glycol. And it makes this stay around longer because we don't care that it's there. And even though this transformation generally happens in the liver, a good percentage of ethylene glycol, maybe let's say 20%, but of course that can vary, will go into the urine as ethylene glycol. And so giving femepazole helps shunt this pathway of ethylene glycol going out in your pee as opposed to going through ADH to turn into these toxic acids. So the medication actually keeps the ethylene glycol in your system? 
Right. It doesn't decrease it. It actually keeps it sticking around longer. And that's in hopes of keeping it from becoming the acid. Exactly. And is that because the acid is the toxin? Exactly. So someone who is given the medication is actually going to have ethylene glycol in their system longer. It's not going to be less ethylene glycol. Correct. The other thing you, the other thing I want to talk about, that work, um, is the acids that we have. When they become toxins, um, we heard Dr. Mainland talk about um, a body being acidic. Is this that point? Yes. And so I know that you guys have probably heard about the stages of ethylene glycol poisoning, and I want you to understand that the stages of ethylene glycol poisoning are theoretical boundaries. Why, okay. why do you say they're theoretical boundaries? Because if you kind of think about, I think a good example is for those of you who have may, maybe studied history, and they talk about certain ages and historical time. It's not like you go from medieval times or the Middle Ages and boom on... December 13th, 1453, it turns into the Renaissance or something like that, okay? They are designed to help understand what was going on. The same is true in these stages. And so the first stage is when this ethylene glycol is floating around as ethylene glycol. And so this is where we get drunk. Now drunk is not a medical term, so we would call this central nervous system intoxication. Now it's not like all of a sudden, all the ethylene glycol went away, and stage one is over, and now, thus hence, heretofore, we are going into stage two. Now, stage two has a name called the cardiorespiratory phase. Um, I like to think of it more as the acid phase. And... When somebody has acids in their blood, then you develop an acidosis. And so the first acid that is formed is this glycolic acid. And this is what starts contributing to the acidosis. And this glycolic acid can stick around for a long time but it also gets transformed to these other acids. So in this stage, as you become more acidotic, for any reason in medicine, like if you've ever heard of diabetic ketoacidosis, your pH, which is normally 7.4, will start going down, and in severe diabetics with diabetic ketoacidosis, I've seen them go down to 6.9. And the same thing can happen in ethylene glycol. And if you know anything about chemistry, you might think this is not a huge change, but it is. Every time you go from 7.4 to 7.3 to 7.2, it has profound effects on your body. And one of the things that our body likes to do to breathe off an acid is to breathe faster. So you're going to hyperventilate. To try to breathe off this acid. And then finally, you start developing the oxalic acid. And oxalic acid loves to team up with calcium 
in our bodies and make calcium oxalate crystals. And these go everywhere, okay? But where you hear it most about depositing would be in the kidneys. So Dr. Hill, I have a couple questions as we're going through the stages. You just said that like when we transform, you know, to different eras in history, um, it's not like four hours, eight hours, 12 hours. How come we don't know exactly when someone is out of stage one and in stage two or out of stage two and in stage three? Well, first of all, it comes down to how fast somebody's alcohol dehydrogenase works for them. There are genetic variations. There are differences in sex. And so there are reasons why this can vary from person to person. The other thing is that in a living person, there are labs that we can send that help us know which stage somebody is in. And we have some post-mortem labs on Julie Jensen, but many of the labs that I would look at when I'm treating a living patient are not able to be done in a dead patient. And so it makes it a little bit harder to discern exactly which stage we're in. And as I'll explain in a moment, it's not like all of a sudden you go from one to the next. These are gonna have some overlap. And there are times when I have individuals that still have a lot of ethylene glycol in their blood, but they, they are already developing an acidosis and they may have calcium oxalate in their kidneys. So it's fair to say from what you just explained to us that the stages can overlap. Absolutely. Are there studies um, about the stages in humans as it relates to ethylene glycol? No. One Why of not? the problems with medical toxicology is the ethical issues with doing studies in patients. So I would not be allowed to administer ethylene glycol to all of you and then start drawing blood. That would be frowned upon. And so we don't do that in medicine. So it's very, very difficult to define what is an exact lethal dose. Uh, we, we can look at past studies and past ingestions, but there are no studies that truly help define that. So I wanna get to what you were talking about in stage two when the oxalic acid teams with calcium and you said it's at that point that we get these crystals that form. Yes. And why is that so bad for the human body? Well, calcium is a very important electrolyte or mineral in our body. And there are a lot of enzymes in our body, kind of like alcohol dehydrogenase is an enzyme. We have many others that depend on calcium our heart beating depends on calcium. Our muscles moving depend on calcium. And so as this oxalic acid is like a sink sucking up the calcium in our body, and that is going to make the calcium circulating in our blood and in our body go really low. And this can precipitate things like seizures, and abnormal heart rhythms. And if you develop an abnormal heart rhythm, then you can die suddenly. And um, is that called arrhythmia? An arrhythmia. So when the oxalic acid teams up with calcium, it's basically, are you saying it's taking the calcium for, from our body? Yes. And it's that taking the calcium from our body that we need that could cause these seizures or arrhythmia? Yes. And what happens if you get an arrhythmia? You can drop dead. Now, after stage two, um, and I know there's no set time, or and these stages can overlap, what, what do you see in patients? This is the most common stage for people to die in if untreated. But...
if you make it to stage three, this is called the renal phase. And this is where the calcium oxalate crystals that have deposited in the kidneys. Now, I already told you, these crystals can deposit everywhere. They can go to the brain, they can go to the heart, but specifically in the kidneys, they can deposit and cause destruction. Now, I know that you guys saw a pathological slide of the renal tubules with those crystals in them. Those crystals are like kidney stones in a way. If you've ever had a kidney stone and it's ripping apart in, in your collecting duct system, it's causing bleeding, it's causing destruction. This is happening at a more microscopic level. And so it disrupts these very critical renal tubules and you get renal failure. Once you're in both of these stages, Fomepazole doesn't do much good anymore because you're past, these have already passed through these stages. And once you're here, you have to have dialysis. Dr. Hill, have you treated um, individuals in stage two and stage three? Yes, and again, remember these are overlapping. So I have had patients in stage two that have developed renal injury. But of course, because they're in the healthcare setting, we are going to treat them with dialysis. And those patients that you have had in stage two, stage three, even if they're overlapping, um, can you tell us what the mental status of those patients were, was? So we've obviously talked about how in stage one, you have this drunkenness. And that is altered mental status. But think about being drunk with alcohol. Just because you're drunk doesn't mean that you can't do stuff, okay? In fact, unfortunately, there are people that drink and drive, and some more successfully than others. But the point is, is that this is nothing more than being drunk. When you get to these stages, there is nothing about being acidotic that makes you comatose or completely out of your mind. I see plenty of diabetic ketoacidosis patients that become acidotic and they're sick and they're uncomfortable and they're miserable, but I can still talk to them as a physician and have a doctor-patient conversation. So there's nothing about the mental status specifically from this or this that ethylene glycol would make you in a, in unable to think and do stuff. Now, there are times when these calcium oxalate crystals can deposit in the brain and cause swelling, and that would cause some altered mental status. And in the end stages of renal failure, where a compound called BUN, or your blood urea nitrogen, this is a test that you get when you go for a physical at your doctor to check your kidneys. If this goes really, really high, then this can cause some altered mental status. But in and of itself, just being acidotic, having these compounds present, doesn't render you comatose and unable to, to do things. We heard from Dr. Mainland that um, Ms. Jensen had some mental status impairment um, on December 2nd and December 3rd. Is that caused by the ethylene glycol and the acidosis? It is not caused by the acidosis. It can be caused by several things. One, <clears throat> ethylene glycol that was still ethylene glycol and had not been transformed yet. And then there were several other medications present 
that really cloud the picture about her mental status, including Ambien, including Librium, including Benadryl, and to a much lesser extent, Paxil. Now, someone who is in acidosis, um, are they immobile? Are they unable to, like, walk or get up? No. Are they unable to have a conversation? They can have a conversation. And would it be, would someone in acidosis be able to use a telephone? Yes. Would they be able to use a computer? Yes. Now, as a medical toxicologist, you're also familiar with Ambien. I am. And can you tell us a little bit about how Ambien could cause um, a change in mental status? Ambien is a medication, the generic name is Zolpidem, and it works at certain receptors in your brain to make you go to sleep. Now, one of the strange things about this medication is that if you don't take it when you are literally in bed to fall asleep, and your idea is I'm gonna go do some things, I'm gonna take it, go do some things, and then go to bed. There have been many, many stories and anecdotes about individuals sleepwalking, making sandwiches in the middle of the night, going out naked and partying in the street, and in some very unusual cases, committing murders. So Ambien has a unique effect on different people to cause them to behave in unusual ways. Thank you. Is there anything else on the chart that you want to show us as it relates to the um, change of ethylene glycol into acidosis into um, death? I'm going to flip the page real quick to demonstrate something. So I'm going to make a chart here, and this is time, and this is going to be concentration. So at this time zero, this is where somebody drinks ethylene glycol, and after a certain period of time, 30 minutes to four hours, you're going to have an ethylene glycol level, okay? That's high. And then as time goes on, and alcohol dehydrogenase works, and aldehyde dehydrogenase works, it's going to start causing this ethylene glycol level to decrease. Now, it does not go to zero in a minute, okay? It doesn't just drop off. So this stage one where you have ethylene glycol in your body is going to last a while. It could last a day, it could last longer. So that's what I mean that these theoretical stages don't have a defined starting and stopping place. Now, as this ethylene glycol undergoes metabolism, this these acids start increasing. Yeah, increasing. Acids start increasing. And so they will go from non-existent and get higher and higher as the ethylene glycol goes down. So the mistake that some people make is to compare ethylene glycol levels in people that did it in a suicidal way or accidentally drank it while they were working in their garage or it was administered to them in a homicidal way and compare what those levels are, which is ridiculous because unless you take every single one of those cases and check what the level was at the same exact time, it doesn't mean anything. 
Because if somebody were to happen to die early on, say here, their level is going to be high. And if this person died from methylene glycol poisoning and they were in a later stage, their level is going to be low. So there is no way to just look at an ethylene glycol level and say, this is a suicide, this is a homicide, or this was accidental. Dr. Harrell, are you telling us that looking at the levels of ethylene glycol in the blood or in the ga gastric content or some other location in the body is not how you determine the manner of death? Correct. So in this part, you can, you can sit down if you're done. But I reserve my right to get back up and draw something if I have to. That's fair. <laughs> So, Dr. Hale, we heard that Julie Jensen had 55 milligrams per milliliter or 5.5 milligrams per deciliter in her blood at the time of her death. Is that indica does that indicate a second dose to you? No. Why not? Well, first let me say that the level... 5.5, milli, it's milligrams per deciliter. That's how we talk in medical toxicology of levels of alcohols. We like milligrams per deciliter. 5.5 milligrams per deciliter, I'm not even sure would show up on our send out test for ethylene glycol. It depends on the laboratory, I suppose. But we would not really consider treating somebody if that was their level, provided they didn't have any of the other metabolic derangements and calcium oxalate and stuff. So that level in and of itself would tell me not to treat a patient. We don't consider treating until above 20 milligrams per deciliter or dialysis anywhere from 30 to 50 milligrams per deciliter. So. This level of 5.5 milligrams per deciliter in the setting of knowing that there were calcium oxalate crystals in the kidney absolutely tells you that she was somewhere in stage two, if not even moving into stage three. And because that level was so low and was actually undetectable by the first lab, we know that she was very far into her poisoning. We also heard that there was about a half a teaspoon of ethylene glycol in her stomach, gastric contents. Does that indicate, based upon the toxicology you've reviewed in this case, that there was a second dose? No. Why not? I'm not going to do the calculations to prove it to you, but, and I think, it's already been stipulated that it is about a half a teaspoon of ethylene glycol. Now, unless several minutes to an hour or so prior to her death, there was a consumption of a little bit of ethylene glycol, which could have happened, I believe that this was a remnant of a prior dose. And This is not, whatever was left, or even if there was a second dose, there was not enough in the blood to be clinically significant. And so I believe that this is just a remnant of a prior dose. So Dr. Hill, if I took a half teaspoon of ethylene glycol, would I need medical intervention in order to, um, metabolize, absorb and metabolize and then eliminate that ethylene glycol? No. How come? 
That is a very small amount. I know that there was shown a NyQuil container, and that was about 30 cc's. And 30 cc's is certainly an amount that can cause you to be toxic, meaning make you go through these stages. When we talk about a lethal dose, we actually don't know what is exactly a lethal dose because I already told you that we don't do those studies. It is thought that a potential lethal dose would be one to two milliliters per kilogram. So a potential lethal dose in somebody who is 70 kilograms would be about 70 or it could be 140, so it's one to two milliliters per kilogram. We're talking about a half a teaspoon, which is a very, very small amount, and that is likely not going to cause you to become toxic, and it is certainly not enough to be lethal. So I heard you say kilograms, but I don't really understand what that means. Can you put that in a way that maybe I would understand what that meant? Yes, because in the United States, we do pounds. Correct. Of course, in medicine, we do kilograms. But the, the quick way that I do it in my head is you take how many pounds you are, and you can divide it by two and get a ballpark. It's technically divide by 2.2, but we're doing math. That's a ballpark way of doing it. That's good for me to know for the doctor's office. I appreciate that. I have a question about... When someone takes a dose of ethylene glycol, based upon the toxicology that you've reviewed, can you determine the date and the time and the amount of the dose? No. In a living patient, can you determine that? No. What do you have to rely on in a living patient to determine the date, the time, and the dose? Well, even in a living patient, we, and unless they tell you, um, it's difficult to pinpoint to an exact time. However, in a living patient, like I alluded to earlier, there are laboratory tests that we can send that will help delineate which stage somebody is in. And those are not tests that can be performed on a dead person. So it makes it a little bit more difficult in a dead person to define where these stages occurred and to map it backwards. But in the case of Julie Jensen, I don't have the benefit of anti-mortem or before she died blood work, but I know three important things. Number one, her level was almost undetectable, implying later on in her stage of poisoning. Number two, there were calcium oxalate crystals present in her kidneys and possibly other places that say that she was at least in stage two, if not moving into stage three. And thirdly, that she died. I want to just go back a second. If you answer this, please um, just explain it to me again. How is there still ethylene glycol in the blood if oxalic crystals are in her kidneys? So going back to this chart, the ethylene glycol is going down little by little over time. It does not precipitously drop off to zero. So you're going to expect a small amount in the blood still, even though you have been making these acids. So when you treat a living patient that is in either stage two or stage three, which you know from the testing you do, um, have you found ethylene glycol in their blood? Yes. And in that situation where there's ethylene glycol in the blood still, we would give both famepazole and if they had acids in their blood and calcium oxalate in their urine, we would also dialyze them. We would do both. 
If someone is acidotic, I think you talked about they would be trying to breathe out the acid. Yes. And would someone continue to do that until they were no longer acidotic? Yes, of course, in, in a situation like this, being untreated, it's not going to necessarily get better. The breathing out the acid isn't necessarily going to get better. Correct. It's not going to make somebody better because they're breathing out the acid. Right. It's your body trying to compensate. However, if somebody is in a late, late stage or if their calcium has gone so low and they are getting much sicker, they may start breathing slower. Doctor, does the toxicology in this case tell you the cause of death to a reasonable degree of medical certainty and probability? Yes. And what is that? The cause of death is ethylene glycol poisoning. And does the toxicology in this case give you a manner of death to a reasonable degree of um, um, medical, to a reasonable degree, I just lost what I was saying, thank you, medical certainty or probability? No. What would your opinion be to a reasonable degree of medical certainty and probability as it relates to the manner of death? Well, I would say it is undetermined. And the reason is that if somebody died by an overdose of pills and you found 20 pills in the stomach, that is most likely a suicide. Unless, of course, somebody had a gun to their head and somebody was saying, here, take this pill, here, take this pill, here, take this pill. That would make sense. Because ethylene glycol is a liquid and because it doesn't take a lot to cause toxicity and even death, it can be administered in a suicidal fashion or it can be administered in a homicidal fashion. But there is nothing in looking at an autopsy in a ethylene glycol poisoning case that is going to tell you whether it is a suicide or a homicide or an accident by virtue of the fact that this is a liquid. And so just by staying strict to the science and strict to the toxicology, you cannot determine just by the science what the manner of death is. And so I would say that the manner of death is undetermined. Can you determine just from the science whether Ms. Jensen had more than one dose of ethylene glycol? No. And is that to a reasonable degree of medical certainty and probability? Yes. Like I said, I can't tell if a few minutes before her death there was a small amount administered. It could not have been a large amount because there was nothing in her blood. Undetectable, a small, tiny amount. So that's why I say that you cannot tell. But more so, just because there could potentially be more than one administration of ethylene glycol doesn't prove that it's homicidal or suicidal. A suicidal person can take more than one dose as well. So the premise that more than one dose occurred, which I don't believe is in reasonable medical certainty, but even if it did, it still does not tell you what is the manner of death. Doctor, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 113. <clears throat> Doctor, is that a diagram that you prepared in your report consistent with the information you provided to the jury on the whiteboard? <clears throat> yes, it's a little bit more detailed, but the, um, <clears throat> sorry, the, what I showed is a simplification of this. Sure. Thank you. I'm going to mark the whiteboard pages. 
as exhibits? Um, just so we have them for the record. Does the court welcome to do that? Okay. So. Um, and then I have no further questions. What number would that be from uh, Madam Clerk? 114. You want to mark them together, both pages? Exhibits 111, 112, 113, and 114. Uh, subject to cross. Do you want that exhibit left up there, Mr. Jamboys? I do. Thank you. But it's been marked for the record. <clears throat> Anytime you're ready, Mr. Jamboys. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, good morning, Dr. Hale. Good morning. Welcome to Wisconsin. Thank you. Uh, I must say that um, I'm very impressed with your background, with your history, your educational attainment, and your professional qualifications. Um, so your, your family must be very proud of you. Are, are your parents? Yes. Aren't they? I bet they're very proud of you, aren't they? I mean, it's well, quite a spectacular array of uh, training and qualification and experience. I think you might be the most ex most qualified defense expert I've ever encountered in my career. So congratulations on that. But I have some questions nonetheless. And I told defense counsel that it was going to be short, but I think it might be a little bit longer than I'd anticipated. My apologies, counsel. Um, so let's start with um, this whole thing about differential diagnosis. You said that you train uh, emergency room physicians in this? Yes. And so you'll stand by the bedside of a patient and you'll go through their history and that's, that's to assist you and, and your students in making a differential diagnosis. Yes. And um, so when you're, you, you train your students when they're doing this differential diagnosis that it's important to get as much information as you can that's relevant to making that diagnosis. Yes. And if you leave out important information, um, that may adversely affect the reliability of the differential diagnosis. Yes. Um, let, let's do an example um, of an analysis of, we'll, we'll take my favorite meal. Um, Your favorite what? My favorite meal. Okay. So. And I bet your husband and I might have something in common in this regard, unless he's a vegetarian. Um, he's I, not. Trust me, we're from Texas. Okay. <laughs> so, good. Then. So my favorite meal would probably consist of two glasses of a nice dry red wine, like a Cabernet Sauvignon, an eight or ten ounce uh, bone-in ribeye steak, and a baked potato with sour cream on it. Um, now, as a medical toxicologist, you're familiar with the, the contents of that kind of a meal, right? Yes. And you're familiar with the effect that it has on the human body, correct? Yes. So let's talk about the good things in a bottle, in a glass, two glasses of red wine. Um, there are, what are some of the good things in a glass of red wine? Well, I'm glad you asked because I actually like to study this kind of thing. I very much enjoy natural product chemistry. And red wine has a lot of what we call phytochemicals, which are chemicals from plants. And they have a lot of beneficial anti-cancer effects and cardiovascular effects. And the reason why red wine is better than grape juice is because grape juice has a lot of sugar which is not good for you, but that's been fermented to alcohol. And in moderation, there are beneficial effects of red wine. And then let's talk about the good things in a bone-in ribeye steak, aside from the fact that it tastes so good. Um, it's got protein. Yes. Are there other good things in a ribeye steak besides protein? Well, I haven't looked so much into ribeye steaks, but um, I personally prefer bison ribeyes oh, because they are less fatty. They're leaner, yeah, so fat's not good. You don't, you don't want fat in your diet? 
Yes. Okay. So a lean ribeye steak and a bison uh, steak uh, both have protein in them, and protein is good for the human body. Yes. And with respect to a potato, baked potato, is there anything good in a baked potato for us? Not particularly, unless they're the purple ones. The purple ones actually have some great phytochemicals in them. Um, but I think a potato is great if you're trying to be gluten-free. Oh, so there's no gluten in a potato. Okay. Correct. And then the sour cream, that's got calcium and other things in it that's good for you, right? Sure. So, and because my wife's sitting right behind me, we're describing my favorite meal. So those are all good things about my favorite meal, right? Well, hopefully, after this trial, she'll make you th your favorite meal. <laughs> no, actually, I do all the cooking in our house, but uh, or most of the cooking. So I'll make it myself. But um, so two hours after I've had a, a meal of two glasses of red wine and a steak and a baked potato, uh, I get hit by a car. You do blood work on me. There's going to you don't you'll find some good stuff in me, and you'll find some. Maybe a little bit too much fat, and because of the because of the fatty ribeye steak, maybe a little bit too much starch because of the corn, the starch in a potato. Um, but that doesn't contribute to my cause of death. But there's good things and bad things in my body. Now we didn't. I didn't ask you about any of the bad things in that meal. So if you're going to if you're going to do an assessment about what kind of a diet a person should have, um, a steady diet of two glasses of red wine and a ribeye steak and a baked potato for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that's not a good diet, is it? Probably not. Because there's some bad things in there too, right? Yes. So in a balanced assessment of what, what is a good meal requires you also to assess what's bad, in, what's bad in the items you're ingesting, correct? I suppose. So red wine, which has all kinds of good things in it, also has some stuff in it that's not good for you. Correct. Like the ethanol that you've got up there. There's ethanol in red wine, and ethanol, by and large, is not good for human beings, right? I think there are studies that show in moderation it has some beneficial cardiovascular effects, but obviously in excess, no. See, so red wine is good for me. That's, uh, I just <laughs> so uh, thank you, doctor. Now let's let's talk about. Um, the differential diagnosis that physicians do and that you did in this case. Um, when you're doing a differential diagnosis, um, and we're talking about, and I'm going to, I'm so happy to have this paper up here because, you know, I, I don't like computers as much as I like paper. So I'm going to, I'm going to use that paper for a minute too. So bear with me for a second. Where's your, where's the marker? Yeah. I think the marker's still I, up there. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. And the microphone. Hold it longer until the light comes on. Yeah, it's on. It's on. Well, what is it working? Okay, now it's working. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so, doctor, can I have a marker, please? Thank you. So for purposes of your testimony, your evaluation of this case, um, you'd actually been retained to do a differential diagnosis. Is that true? A, a cause of death analysis, yes. And well, I, I want to make sure that I get it right. So let's take a look at what you wrote here. You wrote in your report, I was provi provided the below listed case specific materials and relied on the following to render an opinion regarding cause of death. That's yes. That's what you did. Well, what page was that for the page, record? Page two, Your Honor. Thank you. And then on page three, you wrote, my methodology involved considering evidence regarding the scene investigation and you considered that. I mean, you saw crime scene photos? Yes. And case details. Well, we'll get into that in a moment, but you indicated case details. Yes. And pathology examination and laboratory analysis.
correct? Correct. And then ultimately, I evaluated and balanced that evidence using the physician tool of, quote, differential diagnosis, unquote, and evidence-based medicine, as well as knowledge of the medical literature. More importantly, postmortem toxicology findings must be correlated with the scene investigation, case details, and pathology analysis in rendering a cause of death opinion. So that's what you wrote, right? And that's what you did in this case. Yes. Now, I notice on page four, I'm sorry, not page four. Could you hold this for a moment? Here it is, on page six. Um, you wrote at the top there, she acted extremely lethargic, would ramble without reason or making sense. She had lost 15 pounds during the last month alone. Now, do you know where that information came from, that you wrote she had lost 15 pounds during the last month alone? Well, I documented that that came from the Pleasant Prairie Police Department. And do you know where they got that from? From talking to Mark Jensen. So that information was provided to them by Mark Jensen. And you know for a fact that's not true, don't you, by looking at the case in this, by looking at the information that was in this case, you know for a fact that Julie Jensen had not lost 15 pounds in the last month alone. I don't know. Well, let's take a look at your report again. I will direct your attention to page three of your report. So on page three of your report, under pertinent case details and timeline, um, on, on September 1st, 1998, Julie Jensen went to see Dr. Borman, and she weighed 123 pounds. Does it say that there? Yes. And then on December 1st, she had dropped from 123 pounds to 115 pounds. Do you see that there? Yes. So between December, between September 1st, 1998, and December 1st, 1998, we knew she had lost exactly eight pounds. Well, I don't know if I would say exactly, but that is what is reported in this information. Well, of all the, you do know that at the time that Julie was, at the time of her autopsy, were you aware that the forensic pathologist did not have a scale? I heard that, yes. So when he wrote in his, uh, autopsy report that she was approximately 110 pounds. That was his estimate of her weight by looking at her. Probably. Correct? So the most, the two most reliable weights that we have for Julie Jensen was those that were from her doctor's office, correct? Yes. Because when I go see a doctor, the first thing I do is step on a scale. And that's what most people do when they go see a doctor. Yes. I mean, you go see a doctor, too, don't you? Even though you are one, you go see a doctor, right? Yes. And does your doctor have you step on a scale? Yes. And they take your, and they record your weight? Yes. And that's what happens to all of us when we go see a doctor. We get on a scale, and the doctor records our weight. Yes. So this September 1st, 1998 weight of 123 pounds is pretty darn accurate, wouldn't you say? I would think so. And this day, weight of 115 pounds on December 1st, 1998, is pretty darn accurate, isn't it? I would think so. And then the weight of 110 pounds at the time of autopsy, that's an estimate, right? Yes. But an estimate by a, a very experienced forensic pathologist, right? Sure. But even the, the estimate of a very experienced physician is probably not going to be as accurate as the weight that was recorded on a scale when you step on the scale. I'm sure it depends in part on the scale. Well, doctors rely upon the information that is generated in their office to make their notes, correct? Correct. And so they want to make sure that the information that's in their notes concerning their patient is accurate, right? 
Sure. And if it's the same scale that was stepped on September 1st and then stepped on December 1st, which is, by the way, was that almost exactly three months, um, if there is a problem with the scale, it's probably the same problem they had September 1st and December 1st. So wouldn't it be fair to say that she lost almost exactly eight pounds between September 1st, 1998 and December 1st, 1998? I I guess so, yes. So losing eight pounds in three months is a whole lot different than losing 15 pounds in one month, isn't it? Yes. So when you're considering the source of that information about losing 15 pounds in one month, you might want to consider the source in deciding whether or not that is an accurate or inaccurate result. Because it's inaccurate to say she lost 15 pounds in one month, isn't it? Well, maybe he was ballparking it. I mean, I'm sure that he wasn't specifically the one weighing her, but I don't think that that's a huge discrepancy. But it is a discrepancy, and actually it is pretty big to say 15 pounds in one month when actually she'd lost eight pounds in three or four months. Correct? That's a pretty big discrepancy. It's a difference, yes. So let's consider the motivation that Mark Jensen might have had for lying to the police about how much weight Julie Jensen had lost in the last month of her life. Might he have been trying to make it look like Julie Jensen was unstable and emotional and lost her appetite and was suicidal? Wouldn't Judge, that would be a good way to support that proposition? There, there's an objection. What? I would object as to argumentative. Uh, overruled. Go ahead. That means you can answer the question, Doctor. Did you hear the question? I felt like it was more like a speech, but if you want to ask the question again, ask it more specifically. Okay. Would you agree that an acute, I'll ask it, I'm just going to ask a different question because I don't like, well, I don't want to make a speech. You understand that Mark Jensen sits over there and he's accused of murder of Julie Jensen. I understand that. And you do understand that, now this may be a surprise to you, but you do understand that sometimes people that are accused of murder, who actually committed the murder, have a motive to lie to the police about it. Sure. And so you would agree that Mark Jensen, the accused murderer in this case, if in fact he murdered Julie Jensen, has a motive to lie to the police and everybody else about Julie Jensen's condition in the month or two preceding her death. Would you agree with that? I suppose, but my role in this case is not to assess the credibility of Mark Jensen or anybody else. My role in this case is to look at the medical science. Actually, that's not true. That's not what you wrote in your report, is it? What you wrote in your report was, my methodology involved considering evidence regarding the scene investigation, case details, pathology examination, and laboratory analysis. Ultimately, I evaluated and balanced that evidence using the physician tool of, quote, differential diagnosis, unquote, and evidence-based medicine, as well as knowledge of the medical literature. More importantly, the post-mortem toxicology findings must be correlated with the scene investigation, case details, and pathology analysis in rendering a cause of death opinion. So you were looking at the scene investigation and case details and pathology analysis in rendering a cause of death opinion. Exactly, and your question was about the credibility of certain witnesses, which is not my role in this case. You indicated I provided the below I was provided the below listed case specific materials and relied on the following to render an opinion regarding cause of death. Pleasant Prairie Police Department records. Yes. Scene photographs. Yes. Dr. Borman records. Yes. Letter to Dr. Borman. Yes. Dr. Borman trial testimony. Yes. Medical records of Julie Jensen. Yes. Kenosha County Medical Examiner records. Yes. And then all these toxicology labs, uh, St. Louis, University of Kentucky, AIT, and NMS. Um, what, what page were you reading off? I'm sorry, page two, Your Honor. Thank you. Now, and, and, you, and by the way, you know, in terms of your medical, toxicology, medical toxicological analysis, um, would it surprise you to learn that um, the Dr. Mainland thought that your analysis was quite elegant and, uh, and accurate, which is not surprising because you're a toxicologist. So it should stand to reason that you know a lot about 
um, poisoning, and you know a lot about ethylene glycol and, and how it's metabolized into the system. So there's not any really great discrepancy between Dr. Mainland and you as to ethylene glycol as being a potential contributing factor to the death of Julie Jensen. We all agree that Julie Jensen was poisoned with ethylene glycol. I mean, you agree with that, right? Yes. And Dr. Mainland agrees with that as well. Is that, and Dr. Shamless, for that matter, agrees that she was poisoned with ethylene glycol. The information in this case would be diagnostic for ethylene glycol poisoning, isn't it? Yes. So there's no question about that. The question is, what actually killed her? And the fact that she was poisoned with ethylene glycol, that does mean that she could have died from ethylene glycol poisoning, doesn't it? Say that again? The fact that she was poisoned with ethylene glycol, that does indicate that she could have died of ethylene glycol poisoning, doesn't it? Yes. And that's all you looked at was this toxicological stuff? You didn't consider all of the other information? That is incorrect. Yes, because I know that you considered, for example, that Mark Jensen had told the police on December 3rd that she'd lost 15 pounds in a single month, and you know that's not true. I agree that there's a discrepancy between 8 pounds and 15 pounds, and whether there's a discrepancy in her weight or whether she lost 16 or 7 or whatever is something that I recorded in the pertinent case details, but it really doesn't play a huge role in my ultimate opinion. Because whether the accused murderer lied to the police doesn't affect your medical analysis? You're not going to answer the question? That was a question I was put to you. Judge, I think this is an argumentative line and not relevant as to what Dr. Hale has testified to. We'll, we'll uh, let the doctor ask her that one, answer that one question. Can you repeat the question? Could you read it back, please? Because whether the accused murderer lies to the police doesn't affect your medical analysis, you're not going to answer that question? That was a question. So right now your line of questioning is about a discrepancy in a patient's weight. And I don't really see that as necessarily a lie. And and if it is a lie, it is not something that affects my analysis. Because you're just looking at the medical information. No, I'm looking at the totality of the evidence and getting the best history that I can, the best timeline that I can, and I consider I consider things that Mark says. I realize that he is accused of a crime. And I realize that Julie is not here to tell us her side of the story, but there are things where in her medical records and otherwise you can essentially paint the picture of what was going on. You know, I'm going to return to my seat for a minute. I'm going to turn this off because I'll get back to this in a little bit, but I, I want to return to my seat. I don't never, want you to get the you impression. You never wrote that, anything. I know, but I'm going to. Okay. I'm just not going to, but I thought I'd better go back to my seat and sit down and go through this report a little bit more with you, okay? Okay. So I didn't want to give you the impression that I was kind of towering over you. I wanted, so I thought it'd be make you more comfortable if I sat over here. You are not making me uncomfortable. Oh well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so even though you're rendering an opinion as to the cause of death in this case, and it's based upon largely upon your qualifications, your extraordinary qualifications as a medical toxicologist. You do acknowledge that you're looking at a bunch of other stuff in this case as well. Correct. When, when I'm in the emergency department setting, I can talk to my patients, or if they're unconscious for some reason, reason, I might get the history from a friend or a family or the paramedics that bring them, and so the history is obtained that way. So, for example, if you've got a 
person, a guy that's rushed into the hospital, and you ask him, well, how much you've had to drink? And he says, hey, Doc, I've only had a couple of glasses. I've only had a couple of shots of whiskey. And his wife is standing right there, and she says, Elmer, you know you had a half a bottle of whiskey. Tell this doctor the truth. You know at that point that you get information from a different source that might be more reliable than the information that's provided to you by the patient, right? Well, you would consider the statements made by both individuals, and then ultimately you would have an ethanol level that might confirm who is correct or not. So if his serum level or his blood level is a point three two, then you know that it's more likely the wife was telling the truth than the guy that's telling you who you only had a couple of shots of whiskey, right? Yes. And um, so in this case, uh, when you're listening to this, you're looking, you're getting, you're looking at the history of the case as well as looking at what's just in the blood and, and urine and stomach contents of Julie Jensen, right? Right. So you offered the opinion that there was no convincing evidence here that Julie had more than one dose of ethylene glycol, right? Correct. Are you aware that Mark Jensen told another person that he had administered two doses of ethylene glycol, that he administered one dose with a glass of orange juice on the, in the evening of December 2nd, and then he administered a second dose of ethylene glycol uh, with, a, with orange juice the next day? Judge, I'm only objecting to a fact not in evidence because it was juice, not orange juice. So I just wanted to be clear. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'll say. Well, can, can I make a ruling? Please. Can you change the juice and we can proceed? So on December 1st, the evening, morning, evening hours of December 1st, um, well, I should say, let me back up. Were you aware that Mark Jensen had told a fellow inmate in the county jail that a in the evening of December 1st, 1998, he administered a dose of ethylene glycol to Julie Jensen by mixing it approximately one-third antifreeze and two-thirds juice. Were you aware that he had said that? Yes. And were you aware that he also then told that same inmate the next, that on the next day he administered another dose of ethylene glycol, again, as approximately one-third antifreeze and two-thirds juice? Were you aware of that? Yes. So um, you don't put that anywhere in your report, though. You didn't consider that. Why is that? I was not aware of that at the time I wrote my report. Oh, but now, so, so at the time you, you did not know that Mark Johnson had made that statement to Aaron Dillard. Correct. Or that at least Aaron Dillard testified. That, I mean, I don't want to, Aaron Dillard's one that testified that Mark Johnson said that to him. Uh, you weren't aware of that. Not at the time that I wrote my report. And were you aware of the, at the time that you wrote your report, that Mark Jensen had confided in a coworker, a friend of his, one night in November, on November 7th, 1998, that he'd confided with his friend, coworker, in an intoxicated evening of, of wife bashing, that he'd told his coworker, Ed Klug, that he'd found a way to murder your wife? No. That he'd found a drug that will crystallize you from the inside out? Did you know that? I believe I remember reading the crystallized from the inside out, yes. That's a pretty good layman's term of describing what ethylene glycol does to you, isn't it? Crystallizes yes. you from the inside out? So were you aware at the time you wrote this report that um, Mark Jensen had a conversation, a drunken conversation with Ed Klug in the early morning hours of November 7th where he'd said, yeah, he was planning to kill his wife poison her with this drug, uh, using Benadryl and this drug, and that would crystallize you from the inside out? No. Now you're aware of that conversation? I am. And you're aware that Ed, Klug, uh, Ed Klug's wife, who's now his ex-wife, uh, stepped up and she also testified that she corroborated what, what Ed Klug told her, that he called her that night and was telling her. As he was talking with Mark Jensen, he'd go up to his room and call her and tell her about this conversation he was having with Mark Jensen about how Mark Jensen was planning to kill his wife. Were you aware of that? I'm aware of that. But not at the time you wrote this report, you weren't aware of that? Correct. Now, I'll say there's a lot of other stuff in terms of your differential diagnosis that the jury has heard over the past several days that you don't make reference to in your differential diagnosis. Is that because you didn't know about this other evidence? At the time I wrote my report, I did not 
know about Aaron Dillard, and I did not know about Ed Klug. Did you know about Kelly Levante? Yes. So you knew that Mark Jensen had a girlfriend, a woman who's having a sexual relationship with in the months preceding Julie Jensen's death? Yes. Did you know that Mark Jensen, that there's internet communications between Mark Jensen and Kelly Levante after they'd commenced this sexual relationship? Well, Mark Jensen is proposing that they run off somewhere and go on a Windstar cruise. Did, were you aware of that? I'm not aware of that. Were you aware that that conversation occurred in the middle of October 1998? No. Were you aware that in the middle of October 1998, Mark Jensen was in an email communication with Kelly Labonte who was proposing that they run off somewhere in 1999 on a Windstar cruise together? No, I am not aware of that. Well, I want you to assume hypothetically the following facts, and now I guess I'm going to go back up there to the list, or to this paper. Is this working now? No. Okay. Now it's working. There's a few seconds delay. So, Doctor. Let's consider the sum of things that you didn't list in your differential diagnosis. Number one, and um, by the way, you know, we all of us make differential diagnoses in our lives, right? We, we might not call it that, but we all make those kinds of diagnoses, right? Say that again? We, or don't all of us make differential diagnoses? I'll, I'll give you an example. Police officers, for example, when they're investigating a case and they're considering whether a murder suspect actually could have committed the crime, they consider motive, opportunity, and capability. Those three things are what every cop has been trained to do when they're conducting an investigation. Motive, opportunity, and capability. And that's kind of maybe the components that you need to make a deferential diagnosis. Is this the guy that did it or not, right? Well, first of all, I would argue that cops should never be rendering a diagnosis or going through the process of a differential diagnosis, and they would be the first to tell you that that is not their job. Secondly, I'm not really sure how what you just said plays a role in differential diagnosis. Well, in a differential diagnosis, what you're doing is there's a, an infinite array of possibilities when you're looking at, when you're talking to somebody, right? Yes. Now, when you're talking to somebody in the emergency room, you're talking to them because you want to make a differ differential diagnosis as to what the problem is with them so you can come up with a course of treatment, right? Yes. So you ask that person questions so that you can make that differential diagnosis. Yes. And don't you think that when a police officer is talking to a person who has, they're in the police station, they want to find out what this person has that they can tell them about the case that they're investigating, right? Well, what the police officer's role is and what a physician's role in are two completely different things. I didn't ask you that, though, did I? I already know that police officers don't do the same thing as medical toxicologists or emergency room physicians. And don't you think every person in the jury already knows Judge, I would that police heard. officers and Emer and emergency medical room physicians do different jobs. I think there's an objection. There is. This is argumentative. Uh, it's not a question. Overruled. Go ahead. So that means you can answer the question. I understand what that means. The problem that I have with what you're saying is that you're saying that police officers use differential diagnosis. And so that is absolutely incorrect. Oh. Well, what do you call it that police officers do? They investigate a scene, and they write reports, and they can make decisions whether to arrest people or not, but they are not diagnosing conditions. Well, do you think they just arrest people randomly, or do you think that when they make the arrest decision is based upon their assessment of the evidence at the scene and their conversation or communication with the suspect? Well, obviously, it depends on the crime, and it depends on the situation. Do you think there are times when police officers just arrest people randomly? Not randomly, but depending on if they are in the process of breaking into a home, then yes, they would probably arrest right away. So the question here was, I mean, the objection was that I was being argumentative. The fact is, um, you're not Sorry, I can't hear you. The, the objection was that I was being argumentative, but the fact is you're the one that's arguing with me here. I mean, it's a simple proposition, isn't it? I would object it? that's argumentative. I would object to that. That's just a, 
Well, it's a simple proposition that police officers don't go about arresting people randomly without regard to the facts that, it, that is presented to them, correct? In general, yes. And we all make decisions based upon the facts that are presented to us, don't we? In the broadest and most general question I've ever heard, I guess the answer is yes. Okay, so let's get back to the more specific question about differential diagnosis. Or a differential, we make a decision based upon the information that is presented to us, correct? Correct. And then we differentiate, we look at the information we choose to believe, we look at the information that's inconsistent with other information we've received, and then we make a decision about our next course of action, correct? Correct, we obtain a history the best way possible and weigh all of those different facts and some facts are more credible or less credible than others. And then we take that history and we do ancillary studies. An ancillary study might be an x-ray or a laboratory test. Hey, Dr. Doctor, I, I appreciate it. I object to him she, cutting she was, off. Okay, she was being non-responsive. Go ahead, Dr. Finish. When you do a differential diagnosis, there are different components of that. There's the history, which, as I've said, you can obtain from the patient or a family member or the paramedics that bring the patient. And you weigh all of that evidence, and sometimes the evidence is incorrect, or it may not be exactly right, or there may be a discrepancy. But you consider those things, and then you look for ancillary studies, such as radiology testing, like a chest X-ray or a CAT scan of a head. Um, or laboratory testing, or biopsies. Those are all things that are ancillary tests. And you combine all of the information, some of it may be helpful, some of it may be incorrect, and you combine it together to render a diagnosis. So you made reference to reliable versus unreliable information, correct? Correct. So you, there is, when you're making a differential diagnosis, there is an assessment of the reliability versus the unreliability of the information that you're receiving, correct? To some extent, but as an emergency physician, I may not always have the ability to corroborate certain information, especially in an emergency department setting where it's, it's fast and you're thinking on your feet. So when you, you get the information and you record it in the medical record, just like I recorded in my report, my report does not include commentary about whether I believe that information or not. I am merely reporting what the evidence shows. And the same thing would occur in the medical record. When I create a medical record and the patient tells me that they just got back from a trip from Mars then I'm going to write in the medical records, this patient just got back from a trip from Mars. Now I realize that is an extreme example, but it gets reported. So to get back to reliable and unreliable information, would you agree that when you're teaching your, um, th your students that you suggest to them that in evaluating information they should rely more on re reliable information and less on unreliable information? Well, I suppose when I'm teaching, I would say the same thing that I just said a minute ago, which is record what the patient tells you, record what you're told. We don't always have a way to know whether a person is reliable or not, or if, the, if it's their family member that is reliable or not. But we report what we're told, and we put that in the medical record, and we don't make an assessment of what is reliable or unreliable. So now I'm going to approach one more time, and this time I'm going to write something, I promise, okay? Um, so for your differential diagnosis, For your differential diagnosis, you considered Pleasant Prairie Police Department records, right? Correct. And that's a broad category, but 
Um, did the Poli Pleasant Prairie Police Department r records include the email communications that I just described to you between Mark Jensen and Kelly Labonte in mid-October 1998? I don't believe they included any email communications, and I'm, I can't say for sure whether the police records uh, reported that or not. So I've got homicide on one side and suicide on the other. My handwriting's not very great, but I mean, maybe I should make this a little bit clearer. So homicide and suicide. So we're going to do a di differential diagnosis here. So um, you did not, you were uh, you were unaware of, or you did not consider, the fact that Mark Jensen had a girlfriend on the side in the months preceding Julie Jensen's death. Judge, I'm going to object to the homicide and suicide being up there. That's a determination for the jury. Yeah, but he's asking questions about it. The I, I think the jury's smart enough to figure out. He's just asking a question. I agree with you, Judge. I think he so could do this So we're going to let it go. Thing with facts versus no facts. I'm just saying. Can mark what That's he fine. wishes. That's fine. You can redirect and I ask will. your expert that what you great. wish. Go ahead. So for your differential diagnosis, you didn't consider the um, the email communications between Mark Jensen and Kelly Labonte in the months preceding Julie Jensen's death? Uh, no, and just... That's sufficient. Just no. You did not. Judge, correct? again, I object to him not letting her finish her answer. Well, Your Honor, the fact is it was a yes or no question, and so she should answer no, and she likes to lecture a lot. I mean, she's talking to me lecturing. She lectures a lot. I just want to know, you did not consider Ju Mark Jensen's communications with Kelly Labonte in the months preceding Julie's death? Yes or no? No. You did not consider the fact that Mark Jensen was having a sexual relationship with Kelly Labonte in the months preceding Julie Jensen's death? No. You did not consider the fact that Mark Jensen lied about that relationship to the investigating officer when he was in asking him questions about Kelly Labonte? You did not consider that either, did you? No. You did not consider the fact that Mark Jensen there's evidence that this jury has heard that Mark Jensen, in the years preceding Julie Jensen's death, subjected her to a sadistic pattern of harassment and humiliation and demeaning behavior. You weren't aware of that, did, weren't you? I was aware of that, yes. Oh, you were aware. You were aware that Mark Jensen, in the years preceding Julie Jensen's death, had repeatedly um, done hang-up phone calls, had repeatedly left emails or sent her emails with the penis pictures, that he repeatedly left penis pictures around the house for her to find? You were aware of that? Judge, I object to the nature of the question. I think if she's aware that pictures and phone calls were had, that's different than Attorney Jamboy's indication that it was Mark Jensen. Well, that's a, again, that's a jury determination. I agree. I think that the question just isn't clear for the expert when we're talking about was she aware of photos and harassing phone calls versus Mark Jensen being the person that did them. She's I think also, that's the problem. He's also an expert, so. I agree, but Attorney Jan Boyce just wants a yes or no, so I'm just trying to make sure that we're clear on the question so that she doesn't say no but and then she can't finish you, her answer. You know what, Judge, I'll just I'll withdraw that question. Thank you. So you were aware that Julie Jensen was the was the subject of a sadistic campaign of harassment and abuse. You were aware of that, right? I was aware of that situation, yes. Well, um, Julie Jensen had kept a log of all these patterns of harassment, correct? I know that now, yes. That um, Julie didn't know who was doing this, but somebody was calling them all the time and hanging up the phone. You were aware of that? I was aware of that situation, yes. It went on from early 1992 through August of 1998. You were aware of that situation? Yes. You were aware that um, in addition to the hang-up phone calls, they would, the, the whoever was doing this would leave a series of penis photos all around the house or that allegedly leave them with, at Mark Jensen's place of business and Mark would come home and show them to her. You were aware of that? I'm not aware of that specific scenario that you just described. Oh, you weren't aware of the fact that Mark Jensen showed these photos that, that he got, that he, he 
said he got them at the at his office, and then he'd come home and show them to Julie. You weren't aware that he did that. Not that specific thing, no. Were you aware that um, Julie Jensen received emails um, with th these disgusting um, pornogra pornographic penis photos attached to them? Were you aware of that? Um, not specifically as you describe. Well, were you aware that on April 13th, 1998, Julie Jensen received an email, and she put, put it in her log of harassment that she received an email on April 13th, 1998? I'm aware of the situation, but not of the specific date or are you, specifics. Are you aware of who actually created that email that Julie Jensen complained about on April 13th, 1998? No. Are you aware that this jury saw that it was Mark Jensen that created that email that made it look as though it came from Turtle to Julie Jensen? Were you aware of that? No. Were you aware that it actually was an email that Mark Jensen had created himself with 15 different penis photos on it that he took out his name and put in Turtle as the person that was from, took out his name and put in the name Julie Jensen as the person it was to. Were you aware that Mark Jensen did that? No. Are you aware that the jury is, now the jury has seen very clear evidence of that. Would you agree that that kind of behavior reflects a, a malicious, a sadistic frame of mind on the person who would do something like that? Yes. And would that be relevant to the issue of whether or not a person who did that on April 13th, 1998, as part of a pattern of harassment for the last several years, would have a motive to murder Julie Jensen on December 3rd, 1998? Possibly. And would you agree that if Mark Jensen was planning to go on a cruise with his girlfriend in October of 1999, and he, he was talking with his girlfriend in October of 1998 about that cruise, would you agree that Mark Jensen needed to do something with his wife, correct? I'm not going to agree with that. I would say that that makes him guilty as an adulterer, but not necessarily as a murderer. Sure. I mean, he could have wanted to get a divorce, right? Yes. And he could have planned to get a divorce, right? Yes. In fact, at the time that communication was taking place between Mark Jensen, who was married to Julie Jensen, <laughs> Kelly Labonte at that point was not actually any longer Kelly Labonte. Her name was actually Kelly Greenman, and she was married to Mark Greenman. Did you know that? No. Did you know that Kelly Labonte or I'm sorry, Kelly Greenman at that point was communicating with Mark Jensen via email and saying, well, you know, I know what I'm going to do with my issue. What are you going to do with your issue? Do you, are you aware that Kelly Greenman had sent that communication to Mark Jensen on, in the middle of October 1998? No. Were you aware that Mark Jensen responded that, well, you know, details, that's just noise in the greater picture of things. Do you, were you aware that that's how he responded to the details that he was supposed to be taking care of? His wife and his children, they were just noise in the greater picture of things in Mark Jensen's estimation? Were you aware of that? No. Were you aware that during the course of the ensuing months and ensuing days, from the time he had this con communication with Kelly Levante or Kelly Greenman, Right up to the time of Julie Jensen's death, there was not one single search on Mark Jensen's computer for a divorce attorney. Were you aware of that? No. Not one single search about a marital property agreement. Were you aware of that? No. There was not one single search about child custody. Were you aware of that? No. There was not one single search about anything relating to divorcing his wife or property maintenance or property division. Were you aware of that? No. But there were several searches about botulism, about, um, I don't know, bo pipe bombs. There was uh, several searches using the anarchist cookbook looking for ways to kill your spouse. Were you aware of that? Judge, I would object. That's not what those searches said. Well, I think there was one search how to kill your wife. It was the sentencing of a pipe bomb person. So that's different. And remember, we advised the jury that just because it wasn't on the screen, right, we'll, we'll withdraw that last course. Okay, so you were aware, you, you were not aware that Mark Jensen had gone on the internet and was looking up things like botulism, pipe bombs, um, a variety of other poisons. You weren't aware of that? No. You, were you aware that, you know, a word search was done for the unallocated space of Mark Jensen's computer? Uh, and the number one word that was searched more than that came up more often than all the other words was poison. Were you aware of that? No. 
Were you aware that Mark Jensen had 20, several hundred, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of penis photos on his work computer in 2002? Were you aware of that? No. Would, you would agree that for a man to have hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of penis photos on his computer, that's a very unusual thing. Would you agree? Yes. It reflects an obsession, perhaps, an unhealthy obsession with male genitalia. Would you agree? Yes. And if Mark, so if somebody was leaving these penis photos all around the house for years and years and years and years. The fact that Mark Jensen has several hundred penis photos on his computer, that might reflect that he's the person that's doing that, correct? Possibly, yes. It's a reasonable inference, isn't it? Yes. Were you aware that Mark Jensen, in the early stages of his relationship with Kelly Labonte, she'd become Kelly Labonte again by this point, that he was asking her to describe in great detail the size, shape, and circumference of every penis she'd ever encountered in her life. Were you aware of that? Judge, I would object as to relevance for this witness. Well, I think he's asking her what she considered when she made her opinion. But the understanding from the jury is that was after Ms. Jensen had passed, so I'm not sure as how it's relevant to this doctor's opinion as to cause and manner of death. Actually, Your Honor, there's no indication that that conversation necessarily occurred after Julie Jensen's death. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. That's fine. Uh, that, 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 that's not a correct statement. So we'll go ahead and continue. So uh, did you answer that last question? I don't remember if you did or not. I don't remember. Okay. Could, you, could the reporter read back the last question, please? Were you aware of Mark Jensen in the early stages of Kelly Labonte began by this point that he was asking her to describe the size, shape, and circumference of every thing she ever encountered. No. So in all the cases that you've testified before in your life and evaluated before in your life, have you ever encountered somebody who did something like that? Objection relevance. Well, I think you asked her about her experience and what sort of cases she's done. I didn't ask her about the specific facts, I'm sure. I mean, it's just not relevant. About some to specific facts, poisoning and stuff like that. That's her expertise, Judge. That's why I, I asked her that. that. So go ahead, ask the question. Could you read the question back, please? So on all the cases that you evaluate, have you ever Yes. You encounter somebody that had 2,200, hundreds and hundreds of penis photos on their computer? <laughs> there have been plenty of cases I've been involved in where there's pornographic material on somebody's computer. Okay, so you've encountered a case where a male suspect in a murder case had on his computer hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photos of penises. Not specifically as you describe, no. I have a question right now. Our break is coming really close. Do you, I don't want to interrupt your cross, but are you close? Not even close. Not even close, Judge. No, we're going to take a break. Take your break, folks. Uh, hopefully you can get by here.
Swift. Swear allegiance to the Dallas Cowboys. We're back on a record on uh, Mark D. Jensen, 2002 CF314. Appearances are the same. Jury's back in the courtroom. The doctor is still on the stand under oath. And Mr. Jambois, you can continue with your cross. Thank you, doctor. Um, thank you, judge. And thank you, doctor. Um, so I have this this list up there, and I don't, I don't have anything underneath it. But in, in terms of the differential diagnosis, can everybody hear me now? Can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. So your conclusion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty was that Julie Jensen died because, and I'm going to write it down here, ethylene glycol poisoning, is that right? Yes. You can see that? I can. Okay. So, um, but you know, there's the forensic pathologists that have testified in this case have indicated that yes, she was a victim of ethylene glycol poisoning, but that she also, that asphyxia. Asphyxia. Uh, was an issue in this matter, too. Were you aware of that? I am. And in fact, the defense expert, uh, I think her name is Dr. Thomas, has indicated that um, positional asphyxia could have been a contributing factor in Julie Jensen's death. Were you aware of that? I'm not aware of uh, what their opinion is. Okay. Well, you, you as an emergency room physician, you've dealt with, you've had people rushed in who died from asphyxia? Yes. And have you heard of positional asphyxia versus uh, asphyxia that is not positional asphyxia? Yes. Okay. So um, would you agree that the diagnosis of asphyxia is largely, um, it's a process of elimination? Would you agree with that? That ordinarily with asphyxia, there's seldom actual physical evidence of asphyxia. Would you agree with that? Well, since you asked, <laughs> because I didn't come here today to talk about asphyxia, but you have asked about that, and I can talk about asphyxia, which requires not a yes or no answer, so I need to explain. Well, doctor, I, I only want you to give yes or no answers to yes or no questions, so go ahead. Tell us about asphyxia. Asphyxia merely means that you're not getting oxygen in. And when you talk about asphyxia, it is very important to clear up the semantics because I have heard in this case a number of different semantics thrown around. And so we need to clarify some definitions first. Asphyxia, like I said, means that you're not getting oxygen. So in the generalist of senses, if all of the oxygen was sucked out of this room right now and carbon dioxide was pumped in or some other gas compound, then by definition, that is asphyxia. If you drowned or have a near drowning, that is a form of asphyxia. Then there are individuals 
that suffer from what would be called positional asphyxia. Now, positional asphyxia is somewhat rare, but it would be in a situation where somebody gets drunk and then falls off the bed and they get wedged between, say, the nightstand and the bed, and they're in a position where they are not able to breathe, and that is positional asphyxia. There is also something called prone asphyxia. Prone asphyxia is this thought that when you are on your stomach that you can't breathe, which is absolutely false because there are, it's well known that even with COVID, when there was a great deal of lung injury, that people were not oxygenating well, what would we do with a lot of them? We would flip them onto their stomach. So there's nothing about being on your stomach that causes asphyxia. In fact, there are a number of things that actually cause it to improve, meaning your oxygenation. There is also something called compression asphyxia. And compression asphyxia is this thought process that if you apply enough weight to somebody, that that will cause them to stop breathing and they will asphyxiate. Now, there are plenty of studies and there are some individuals, some emergency physicians in California that have studied this. And they have shown that even putting massive amounts of weight on somebody on their back does not cause significant changes in ventilation and oxygenation. I tell a story of a patient that I had one time where he was a homeless gentleman and he fell asleep in the dumpster. And along came the next morning the trash compactor. And the trash compactor came and exerted this massive amount of compressive force on him. And then, of course, they realized this and they called 911. And he came to me in the emergency department. And he had externally a great deal of petechiae, which are little pinpoint hemorrhages from basically here on up and also something called a subconjunctival hemorrhage. A subconjunctival hemorrhage is the whites of your eye that below the conjunctiva, which if you've ever had conjunctivitis, you've probably heard that term, it bleeds, the blood vessels bleed in the white parts of the eye. And so it takes a tremendous amount of compressive force to asphyxiate somebody. And then there are external changes that you see on the body to show that asphyxia has happened. Now, another form of asphyxia is strangulation, where someone gets choked or there's some type of cord or tie around the neck. And when that happens, there are visible injuries externally, as well as uh, with the hyoid bone, which is a bone in your neck, and the cartilage around your larynx. So those would be indications that asphyxia has occurred. So before we can have a conversation about asphyxia, it is important to, to discuss what we're actually talking about so that we can actually have a real scientific conversation about what's going on. So we have to define, are we talking about strangulation? Are we talking about compression? Are we talking about prone? Are we talking about positional? because those are all different things. Are you finished? I am. Okay, well, see, I didn't interrupt you at all. Now, let's talk about positional asphyxia. You said you saw the crime scene photos? Say that again? You said you, you, said you saw the crime scene photos, right? I did. And one of the crime scene photos, can, could you find the crime scene photo where Julie's in the bed uh, with her? Put it up on the screen. One of the crime scene photos uh, that you examined showed Julie Jensen laying in her bed. The covers were pulled back and she was kind of laying on her side with her arm beneath her and her face was in the pillow. Do you recall seeing that? Yes, I saw that. Okay. Now, um, do you think that could be indicative of the potential for positional asphyxia being a contributing factor to Julie Jensen's death?
position is not a position that would cause somebody to stop breathing. Oh, so you don't think positional asphyxia is a likely factor in this case? Correct. Yeah, that's it. So, so I'm going to put a photo up on the screen, and that I think that's the easiest one for you to see right up there. Um, of course, it's dark right now, but there we go. Um, that's that's the photo that you saw of Julie Jensen at the time of her uh, at the at the crime scene. Yes. And um, you you don't think that could be that that's indicative of the potential for uh, positional asphyxia? No. Now, what if? Um, What if there's testimony uh, that Mark Jensen told somebody that when he came, he, he, when he, he rolled Julie into that position. Now, actually, he told the police that Mark, Mark Jensen told the police he rolled Julie into that position. That might explain kind of the way her arm is, is played there under. She was laying on her back, and he rolled her into that position. Were you aware of that? Yes. <clears throat> and that does look like somebody laying on their back, and they were rolled into that position, doesn't it? Possibly, or it could just be someone that fell asleep intoxicated. Okay, but it's consistent with Mark Jensen's statement to Detective Ratzberg that he rolled Julie into that position, correct? Yes, I suppose so. It's not uncommon for somebody to roll somebody over to assess whether they're alive or dead. Well, that's not why. What if I told you that Mark Jensen told Detective Ratzberg that Julie was laying on her back and she was gra gr gasping for breath, so he rolled her on her side in that fashion. That's, that condition is consistent with that description that Mark Jensen gave to Detective Ratzberg, isn't it? Sure, that could be. No, um, but that position would not cause positional asphyxia, would it? No. Now, were you aware of the fact that Mark Jensen told Aaron Dillard that after rolling her in that on her side like that, he walked back into the room and she was still breathing uh, reasonably well, and he needed to kill her before her children, before he brought the children home. So that he sat on her back, right about right about here, sat on her back and shoved her face in the pillow until she stopped breathing. Now, could that be a form of manual asphyxia? Yes. And that would kill her, wouldn't it? It could, yes. So positional asphyxia, you would exclude that as a possibility? Well, there was no evidence of that, of any kind of asphyxia on the autopsy. Uh, well, let's now pull up that, that other photo. You were aware that Dr. Shambliss had indicated that, the, um, that he'd taken a photo at the autopsy and that he'd, uh, he'd observed um, hemorrhaging on the second, third, and fourth rib of Julie's rib cage. Yes. It wasn't visible on the outside, but it was visible on the inside when he, when he did the classic Y incision and, and pulled the skin back. You remember that? Correct. And Dr. Shambliss had not seen the crime scene photo uh, when he did the autopsy. Were you aware of that? I don't know. Well, now I'm going to direct your attention to the item that's on the screen up here. I'm going to blow it up a little bit. Uh, now, can you see some hemorrhaging along the rib cage that the doctor had testified about? Yes. And the hemorrhaging along the rib cage kind of lines up with where Julie's arm is down here, doesn't it? Would you agree with that? I would say it's kind of hard to say. But well, would, would you agree, doctor, that the hemorrhaging on the rib cage, um, that a reasonable explanation for the hemorrhage on the rib, rib cage is that it's consistent, I, let's put it this way, would you say it's consistent with Mark Jensen's description of the manner in which he murdered Julie Jensen by sitting on her and shoving her face in a pillow? Would you agree that the injuries on the rib cage and the condition of the body at that point, that those factors are consistent with what Mark Jensen is alleged to have said to Aaron Dillard? I find that strange because if I, there's I just ask you whether it's consistent or not. I don't consistent? think it's consistent. You think you think that 
the injuries in the rib cage and the manner in which Julie Jensen is laying there is inconsistent with what Mark Jensen is alleged to have said to Aaron Dillard? I think it's strange that there would not be external signs of injury and internal signs like this that we are looking at um, are nonspecific post-mortem artifact. And I say that because, as we discussed earlier, in my expert witness practice for the Department of Justice, I look at tons and tons and tons, hundreds of opioid deaths, and even more recently because of fentanyl. And invariably, on just about any autopsy report that I review, it is not uncommon to see post-mortem artifact, including petechiae and including hemorrhage, which is an artifact. It's due to the putrefaction process and post-mortem change. And so in the example that I told you about, my trash compactor man, he was obviously compressed. He had a, a large amount of, of compression on him, and he didn't die, but he had the external signs of compression asphyxia. And so if the thought is that it's consistent that this post-mortem hemorrhage on the inside was caused by something on the outside, and there's no signs of it on the outside, I would say that's inconsistent. Now, Doctor, we were talking about your extraordinary qualifications, and in order for you to become a medical toxicologist, um, you had significant amount of training beyond that of an, other physicians. Is that true as a medical toxicologist? Say that again. In order to become board certified as a medical toxicologist, you had a very significant amount of additional training and specific experience beyond that of most other physicians. Isn't that true? Yes. And in order to become board certified as an emergency room physician, you had a significant amount of experience and training beyond that of other physicians in order for you to be even qualified to sit for a, a, a to be board certified as an emergency room physician. Isn't that true? Yes. And you're not board certified as a forensic pathologist. Isn't that true? Correct. I already said that. <laughs> yes, and I'm just emphasizing that point again. So, and yet, uh, Dr. Shambliss and Dr. Mainland are both board certified forensic pathologists. Correct. And both Dr. Shambliss and Dr. Mainland indicated that these injuries, that this presentation of Julie Jensen's body at the time that time she was found, and these autopsy, that autopsy photo, combined with Mark Jensen's confession, alleged confession to Aaron Dillard, that his description is consistent, is consistent with the findings at autopsy and the crime scene photo, but you're denying that. Well, you're asking me my opinion. I, of course, find it strange that these two highly qualified forensic pathologists reviewed the same material and neither one of them thought about asphyxiation as a possibility given the scientific evidence until it was asked of them to retroactively oh, you know, show you, if it was consistent. You, you think that's what happened? You don't think Dr. Shambliss had indicated at the outset that th she could have been asphyxiated? You don't think that? You weren't aware of that? I'm, I'm not aware of that, but I know that there was the consideration of that because of petechiae on the inside, but petechiae on the inside is a nonspecific finding in every autopsy. Uh, what I asked you was this. You were unaware of the fact that Dr. Shambliss from the outset had suspected asphyxia in this case. You were unaware of that? I'm not aware of what he was aware. Um, you're unaware of the fact that at her, at the initial, at the testimony, the initial hearing in this matter, um, Dr. Mainland said she could not rule out asphyxia as being a contributing factor in the death of Julie Jensen? Correct. If you're interpreting these petechiae in a vacuum. I didn't ask you what Dr. Mainland was uh, evaluating. I just asked you whether you were aware that at the time that Dr. Mainland testified at the first hearing, she could not rule out asphyxia as a contributing factor. I'm not aware of what she testified at the time of the first hearing. So, Doctor, t when we look at um, your differential diagnosis, you concluded ethylene glycol poisoning was the, um, was the cause of death in this matter. Correct. 
And you didn't offer an opinion as to the manner of death in this matter. Is that correct? I did. Oh, you did? You indicated that you had an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to the manner of death? I did. What's your opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to the manner of death? Undetermined. Oh, oh, I see. So you couldn't distinguish between possible homicide or suicide. You just said because of the information you had, you couldn't make a choice between homicide and suicide. Correct. Or accident. Or accident. Correct. Well, um, so let's consider some of the information that what the jury has heard to help them decide between homicide and suicide. Um, and now I'm going to approach and I'm going to start writing things down again. You considered some of things that Mark Jensen said, correct? You considered some of the things that Mark Jensen said, correct? Correct. And acknowledging that Mark Jensen is the accused murderer in this case, correct? Correct. So you would acknowledge that in determining reliable versus unreliable, if a person actually murdered somebody, they might be an unreliable source of information about that victim's uh, what that victim was like in the weeks and months preceding her death. Would you agree with that? Correct. So when Mark Jensen wrote, she lost, let's see, well, we'll put this under, when Mark Jensen wrote that she'd lost 15 pounds in first month, in month, in one month, that would kind of suggest, you know, loss of appetite, extreme emotional upset, it's consistent with suicide, isn't it? It's consistent with depression. It's not necessarily consistent with suicide. Well, that's a good point, too. I mean, pe most people that are depressed don't commit suicide, right? Yes. The overwhelming majority of people who are depressed do not commit suicide, correct? I'm not sure what the statistics are. Well, would it sound like maybe 4 in 100,000 for women who are 40 to 45? Does that sound about right? I don't know. Okay, well, let's... Uh, maybe as high as nine out of 100,000 women um, who are age 40 to 45 die by suicide. It's a very low number, isn't it? I honestly don't know. Well, most of us want to live and most of us don't want to commit suicide. But those of us who do commit suicide, oftentimes they're depressed, right? Yes. Um, now, and if a person is depressed, um, they might lose 15 pounds in a single month, right? Or gain. Yeah, or gain. And so you... So if Mark Jensen is saying that Julie Jensen lost 15 pounds in a single month, but we know for a fact that's not true. I mean, you know as you're sitting here right now that Mark, that Julie Jensen did not lose 15 pounds in one month, don't you? Yes, we've already discussed that. Yes. So she weighed 123 pounds, 9-1. Uh, and on 12-1... She weighed 115 pounds, so that's an eight-pound difference. In see, October, September, October, November, December. So in um, in nine in three months, she lost eight pounds. That's way different than 15 pounds in one month, right? I would submit that eight is different from 15. Yes, and then on 12-4, estimated approximately 110 pounds. And none of those figures add up to anything approximately close to 15 pounds in a single month, does it? No. And then um, with suicide, I mean, Mark Jensen was talking about Julie being depressed, right? Correct. Um, but were you aware that Julie Jensen had told her neighbor, Tad Boyd, that she was concerned that Mark Jensen, her husband Mark Jensen, was trying to poison her? Were you aware of that? I was aware of that, yes. And th that she was concerned, that she didn't know if he was trying to poison her or if he was trying to make it look to her like he was poisoning her so that she would do something stupid and then she'd lose the children. Were you aware of that kind of conundrum, that that? problem that Julie was having in making a decision? 
I am aware of that. And were you aware that Julie Jensen uh, had told her third grade, her son's third grade school teacher, Teresa Fazio, that she thought her husband might be trying to kill her? Yes, I'm aware of that. And then within a few days of Julie Jensen sharing with Thaddeus Boyd and with Teresa Fazio her fear that her husband might be trying to kill her, within a few days of that, she ends up dead. You were, were you aware of that? I'm aware of that. Would you agree that those statements are more consistent with this being a homicide than a suicide? Yes. So Julie's statements are consistent with a homicide. Mark Jensen's statements are consistent with suicide, right? Correct. So gee, there's still, you don't know what to decide. Is it homicide or is it suicide? So then, in addition to Julie's statements, we have the murder suspect having a sexual relationship with his girlfriend in the months preceding Julie's death. That's more consistent with his, it's a motive, isn't it? It's a motive for Mark Jensen to murder his wife? It could be. Then we have the years-long sadistic humiliation and harassment of Julie Jensen, apparently at the hands of her husband. That's also indicative of a homicide, isn't it? If he was indeed the person that did that, then perhaps. Okay. Sadistic. Years long harassment and humiliation. And then we have Mark Jensen planning a trip with his girlfriend, a cruise with his girlfriend that's also consistent with a homicide, isn't it? I wouldn't go as far as to say that's consistent with a homicide. I would say that is consistent with somebody having an affair. You're a crappy husband. You're an adulterer. But that doesn't equate to suicide. I mean, homicide. Certainly not. Um, but if he's planning a trip with her, um, unless he's planning to bring his wife along, um, he's either planning, um, he's either lying to Kelly about just keep stringing her along, uh, or if he's telling Kelly the truth about wanting to go on this trip with her, he's got to do something with his wife. You would agree with that? No, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I mean, there are husbands that tell their wives they're going on a business trip, and they're not. I just, the, the salacious details are not part of my differential diagnosis. Um, but Mark Jensen's representations to you are? Mark Jensen's representations were taken at face value to consider, as well as evidence about Julie Jensen and her mental state. And there are facts on both sides that would lead someone to determine whether it's a homicide or a suicide. That is not for me to weigh or decide. And so the point and my role here is I'm aware of these different facts, bad facts for both sides, but my role is to make sure that there is not a misconception in the science, in the toxicology, that suggests one way or another, not to be misconstrued that a teaspoon or a half a teaspoon in a stomach means homicide, or that a whole stomach full of ethylene glycol means a suicide. What I'm trying to express is that my analysis, even though I'm aware of these facts on both sides, my 
cause of death is ethylene glycol poisoning, which is differential diagnosis, because differential diagnosis is a, a diagnosis, and cause of death is a diagnosis. This chart right here with homicide and suicide is manner of death, not cause of death. And I'm aware of both sides. That goes into a manner of death analysis, not cause of death analysis. And my analysis is focused on the science and to represent that there is nothing toxicologically that defines whether this is a suicide or a homicide. And I am not making a opinion about the salacious details that have been presented in this case, which is why my cause of death is ethylene glycol poisoning and my manner of death is undetermined. It is not for me to decide. But in, but you did render an opinion as to manner of death. You said it was undetermined, right? I did. And in arriving at your manner of death, you did look at the salacious details. You consider what Mark Jensen said about Julie being depressed, right? I did. You did consider what Mark Jensen said about her losing 15 pounds in a single month, correct? I am aware, and I know you like making this discrepancy over and over again. I would hope that nobody would you know, make a statement based on what someone says someone weighs, because I have to estimate people's weights all the time, and I'm a seasoned physician, and I don't do it correctly, and I'm sure that he didn't weigh her every day, and it was an estimation. The difference between 8 and 15 is negligible, and I just took it not at the amount, but that there was weight loss, not that that means something. You also considered Dr. Borman's uh, analysis, and Dr. Borman had said that she arrived, that she started manifesting signs of depression on September 1st, 1998, right? Correct. But she'd never manifested any signs or indication of depression before September 1st, 1998, correct? Uh, I don't remember exactly when he said, but there was there were things in his notes and in his testimony describing a declining um, mental status. Well... September 1st, 1998, he talks about Julie Jensen being depressed, correct? Correct. Now, were you aware that it was in August of 1998 that Mark Jensen started communicating with Kelly Labonte and um, going to St. Louis? And, and were you aware that it was in September of 1998 that Kelly Labonte said that that's when she first started having sexual relations with Mark Jensen? Were you aware of that? I'm not aware of when it exactly happened, no. Um, would you agree that a married woman with two small children who suspects her husband is having an affair, that that might cause her to become upset or depressed? Yes. So that might account for Julie Jensen starting to show signs of depression and being upset on September 1st, 1998, if she suspected that her husband was having an affair, right? Correct. And by December 1st, 1998, um, by this time, Mark Jensen's affair with Kelly Levante was in full bloom. That might be another reason for, for Julie Jensen to be distressed, to be distraught, to be upset, right? It could be. And especially by December 1st, 1998, if Julie Jensen was telling t uh, her neighbors and her, and, and her son's third grade school teacher that she thought her husband was trying to kill her, that would be another reason for her to be distressed and upset, correct? Sure. And that might account for her weight loss if she, between... 123 down to 115 pounds, if she thought her husband was trying to poison her, she might be a lot more careful about what she's eating, wouldn't she? Perhaps. Um, and then when you consider this thing over here for depression and so forth, uh, Dr. Borman asked Julie on December 1st, 1998, if she was suicidal, didn't he? Yes. And she specifically said no, she would never commit suicide because of her children, correct? Correct. So that's indication of not suicidal. Wouldn't you agree that a young woman who says, my children are everything for me, I live for my children, I would never commit suicide because of my children, a statement like that is an indication of a lack of suicidal intent? At that exact moment in time. Yeah. On December 1st, 1998. Now, then, at the time of Julie's death, you talked about the ethylene glycol on board, but she also had other things on board, right? Yes. What else did she have on board? She had Ambien. Ambien. Now, 
when Dr. Borman um, evaluated Julie Jensen on December 1st, 1998, he made reference in his testimony to something called Sige caps. Have you ever heard of Sige caps? S I G E C A P S? No. Well, um, it's the first thing, uh, Sige caps, the first letter it stands for suicide. So um, when and it's kind of shorthand for the things that the doctor goes through. Um, suicide, interest. Um. Oh. Doctor, I would object because Dr. Borman actually said he didn't do that when he testified. Actually, it was Dr. Do Dr. Borman's testimony that I got it from. So Dr. Borman rec acknowledged that it was a thing but said that he, that's not what he used when doing the assessment. Let's ask another question. So what you're going to say, oh, what, so what, what, what are you going to say? <laughs> It's called SIG E caps, not SIG caps. Okay, so I got it wrong. Okay, well, that's why I'm a lawyer, not a doctor. So it's SIG E caps. What so, is SIG? Sorry, I didn't know what you were talking about. Oh, so well, my apologies. I thought you were making up some kind of suicide capsule or something. <laughs> so SIG E caps. What's SIG E caps? SIG E caps. SIG E caps. Um, so forgive me because I'm not a psychiatrist that does this every day, but. It's kind of a, a list of things that psychiatrists go through asking questions about um, their mental state, appetite, and you know their mood and things like that, and kind of come up with a score to rate somebody's depression. Okay. Well, Dr. Borman indicated that Julie told him she was not suicidal and that she lived for her children. And by the way, there's a number of other people that said that about Julie Jensen, too. Are you aware of what her neighbors said about her? That her neighbors all said that Julie Jensen was a profoundly devoted, loving, kind, and sensitive woman, that she loved her children. She would do anything for her children. Did they? Were you aware of that? Yes. Um, so Dr. Borman had indicated she said she was not suicidal, and also now, back in 90 or 91, Julie Jensen was seeing a guy by the name of Paul DeFazio, a, a, a therapist, and he also said she was not suicidal at the time that he was seeing her back in 1990 or 91. Were you aware of that? Correct. So two different doctors indicated that she did not appear to be suicidal, correct? Correct. One of them just days before she died, correct? Correct. Were you aware that... Um, and I'll, let's get back to this thing about the other stuff on board. She had ethylene glycol on board. What else did she have on board? So we said Ambien. Ambien. Well, that could be either homicide or suicide, right? Sure. So we'll just kind of put this down here. <laughs> what else was on board? Librium. What else? Uh, Paroxetine or Paxil. I'll just write Paxil. <laughs> yeah. What else? And Benadryl. So Benadryl, Ambien, Librium, Paxil, and ethylene glycol. Correct. Anything else on board or was that it? I'm sorry? Anything else on board or was that it? That That's it. So, uh, so, doctor, as a medical toxicologist, um, certainly you're familiar with the um, with Ambien, correct? Correct. And um, you know that Dr. Borman gave Mark Jensen ten Ambien pills on December second. Were you aware of that? Yes. And were you aware that he gave Julie Jensen three Ambien pills between the time that he got home from that appointment and the morning of December third, nineteen ninety eight? I don't know whether he gave them, she took them, but there were three missing. So um, 
Well, according to Mark Jensen, he gave her three Ambien pills. Were you aware of that? I am aware of, of that statement, yes. I mean, I, I'm talking about the statement he gave to Detective Ratsburg. He told Detective Ratsburg he gave her a pill when he got home. He gave her another Ambien later that night, and he gave her a third Ambien the morning of December 3rd. Were you aware of that? I'm aware of that. I just don't remember exactly when. And that's consistent also with what Mark Jensen told Aaron Dillard. Uh, were you aware of that? Uh, I, I don't recall. Now, according to Mark Jensen, when he was both speaking to Detective Ratsburg and when he was speaking with Aaron Dillard, Mark Jensen indicated to both of those persons that Julie Jensen was, uh, was awake at around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning of December 2nd, and that she appeared to, in the early morning hours of December 2nd, and that she appeared to be, um, she said, she, I'm, I'm feeling drunk, you know, I, I feel like I'm drunk, and that Mark Jensen indicates that he took her to the computer and showed her this paroxetine list of possible side effects, and one of them was um, vertigo and a variety of other things that might explain her being intoxicated. Do you remember, do you remember hearing about that? Yes. And, um, and it was after that, it was after he'd uh, done that in the early morning hours of December 2nd that he went to see Dr. Borman uh, mid-morning December 2nd and um, asked Dr. Borman for something to help Julie sleep. Were you aware of that? Yes. Now, uh, and Mark Jensen told that to both uh, Paul Rasberg and to Aaron Dillard. So, um, and furthermore, Dr. Borman indicated that Mark Jensen came to him and said that he needed to get something to help Julie sleep. You're aware of that? I am. So it's a pretty reliable scenario that actually Mark Jensen did, in fact, go see Dr. Borman on the early morning hours of December 2nd, or mid-morning December 2nd, say 10, between 10.30 and 11 o'clock, and um, Judge, I would object as to the time. Dr. Borman did not testify to that. Okay, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll, rephrase, I'll, rephrase, I'll rephrase it. According to evidence that will be presented in this case, Dr. Uh, Mark Jensen filled the prescription for the Ambien at around 11.13 a.m. on the morning of December 2nd, 1998. Um, so that kind of indicates that sometime before uh, 11, 12, or 11, 13 a.m., he'd obtained the prescription for Ambien from Dr. Borman. Would that be a fair statement? Yes. Now, according to Dr. Borman, he indicated that it was to be administered at night, correct? That, correct. And that's, re that's typically when you give somebody Ambien, isn't it, when they, before they go to bed at night, right? Correct. But according to Mark Jensen, both in speaking with Detective Ratsburg and in speaking with Aaron Dillard, he gave Julie Jensen a dose of Ambien as soon as he got home from the doctor. Were you aware of that? Yes. That's, that's not what Dr. Borman had prescribed, was it? Probably not. And Mark Jensen explained to Aaron Dillard that he needed the Ambien to so that Julie would sleep through the adverse symptomology of ethylene glycol poisoning. Were you aware of that? I am now, yes. And you know, that's a pretty good way to do it, isn't it? Objection argumentative. Uh, rephrase it, Mr. Jim. Well, that, if Mark Jensen wanted Julie Jensen to sleep through the symptomology of ethylene glycol poisoning, giving her Ambien would assist him in accomplishing that objective, wouldn't it? Yes. And then, according to Mark Jensen, talking to Aaron Dillard, now not talking to Detective Ratsburg, uh, Aaron Dillard indicated that he administered a second dose of ethylene glycol to Julie Jensen in the evening of December 2nd, along with a mixture of juice and antifreeze. Um, now, that second dose of Ambien. That would have been about the time that Dr. Borman was expecting him to give her the first dose of Ambien, wouldn't it be? Correct. And certainly, Dr. 
Borman was not expecting Mark Jensen to administer a dose of ethylene glycol, was he? I wouldn't think so. Yes. Judge, but I would gonna... object just to argumentative and not relevant for this witness. A question and answer will stand. Go ahead, Mr. Jambos. And, you know, Dr. Um, Ethylene glycol is by itself an odorless, sweet-tasting substance, isn't it? It is odorless. Laboratory-grade ethylene glycol is very sweet. There are bittering agents that are added to antifreeze. There are now. <laughs> but in 1998, there were additives to antifreeze, but they didn't have a requirement of, of bittering agents in the state of Wisconsin. Were you aware of that? Well, I know that the bittering agents were added in the late 1990s, and it kind of varied from place to place. Uh, so I, I believe you that if there weren't, then it would have a sweet taste. But, 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 you know, automotive antifreeze is not pure ethylene glycol, is it? I mean, automotive antifreeze does have additives to it, and they're not added to make it taste better. They're added to um, prevent car systems from getting rust. The stuff's got rust inhibitors in it, right? Truth be told, I am not an expert on general automotive, automotive knowledge, so I don't know. Doctor, we've stumbled upon something that I know more about than you do. So you, you're unaware that automotive antifreeze has rust inhibitors contained within it? Never really thought about it. Okay, okay well, in any event, um, the if the, the ethylene glycol that Julie Jensen was ingesting, we know this, it was not laboratory-grade ethylene glycol, right? There's no reason to think that. Correct. The off-the-shelf antifreeze that people buy is got a lot of, it's, it's almost pure antifreeze, but it's got a lot of additives, it's got additives for automotive cars. For example, it's got a fluorescing agent in it, right? Some of them do, yes. And, and the fluorescing agent is so that mechanics, people who work on cars, like me, can find out where, if a if car is leaking antifreeze, we can see it using a uh, black light. Correct. Um, so in order to get somebody to unknowingly ingest ethylene glycol or antifreeze, it would be necessary to put it in another substance and dilute it, correct? Correct. Because otherwise the person would know they're drinking antifreeze, right? Probably. So. Fixing the ratio at, say, one-third antifreeze and two-thirds juice um, would be a good way, perhaps an effective way, to, dis to disguise the presence of antifreeze in the substance that you're slipping to somebody? Maybe. So if, in fact, Mark Jensen did tell Aaron Dillard that on the evening of December 2nd, 1998, I administered a second dose of ethylene glycol to Julie Jensen by putting one-third antifreeze and one-third juice, and then I also gave her an Ambien pill. Um, there's nothing in the medical and in the, in the toxicological results that you saw at the time of Julie's death that would be inconsistent with what I just described, is there? No. And if Mark Jensen had told Aaron Dillard that the next morning he gave Julie Jensen, a third dose of ethylene, uh, I'm sorry, a third dose of Ambien, a third Ambien pill. Um, there's nothing inconsistent with Julie Jensen's uh, toxicological presentation at the time of her death that's inconsistent with that, is there? Right, there's no way to look at a post-mortem drug level and say how many were administered and exactly when. And that goes for all of these post-mortem substances. But you are aware that the medical examiner's office, the, the deputy medical examiner who was at the scene, collected all the items that were there, right? Including, I mean, he collected the Ambien that was there, right? Judge, I would, uh, this is actually, it wasn't the medical examiner. This is not correct. Just rephrase it, Mr. Okay, well, you are aware that whichever authority it was, they collected the Ambien at the scene. There were seven Ambien pills left out of 10, 10 Ambien pills. You were aware of that? Yes. So sometime between the point where Mark Jensen got them on November 13th, I'm, I'm sorry, on December 2nd at 11.12 or 11.13 a.m., sometime between that point and the afternoon of December 3rd, 1998, when these pills were collected, 
somebody had used three Ambien pills, correct? Correct. And Mark Jensen's description that he administered three Ambien pills to Julie Jensen from between the morning of December 2nd, 1998 and the morning of December 3rd, 1998 would be consistent with that pill count, correct? It would be consistent with the pill count, yes. But it would be inconsistent with the doctor's uh, prescription as to how much Ambien to give somebody, right? Correct. Um, you would never, doc, Dr. Borman never told Mark Jensen he should give, you should give her a pill as soon as you get home, another one tonight, and another one the following morning. He never said that to... I don't would, believe so. Because that's not consistent with the dosage for Ambien, is it? Well, it's not the way that it's prescribed. Well, especially for a, a woman who weighs between 110 and 115 pounds. I mean, if I took an Ambien pill, I weigh, we'll just say approximately 200 pounds, okay? So, well, uh, I don't want there to be a discrepancy in your weight, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, okay. We'll say 202.4 pounds, okay? Let's say I weigh approximately 202.4 pounds. Um, I might be able to take a couple, uh, maybe a couple of Ambien pills would have the same effect on me as one Ambien pill would have on Julie Jensen, right? I don't know. But certainly Dr. Borman would not have prescribed, would not have told Mark Jensen, yeah, you should give her three Ambien pills in the next 24 hours. Judge Aston answered multiple times. We'll take this answer and we'll move on. Go ahead, answer it, doctor. Correct. Now, on the other hand, if Mark Jensen said, I gave her the first Ambien pill as soon as I got back from the doctor so that Julie would sleep through these symptoms, that's a pretty good course of action for somebody who wanted her to sleep to take, isn't it? Judge, this is all asked and answered. Go ahead and answer the question. The purpose of Ambien is to make you sleep, whether it's through something or just to sleep through the night. So yes, it's the Ambien is a medication that helps you sleep. So let's move um, to, and now we're going back to this differential between homicide and suicide. Um, you are aware that Mark Jensen told the authorities that he went to work. Um, he left for work sometime at 11 o'clock in the morning and arrived to work sometime around noon on December 3rd, 1998. 1998. Are you aware of that? Yes. Are you aware that there are three people who were working in the office that day who testified in this courtroom in the last few days? Are you aware of that? I'm aware, but I don't know what their testimony is. Well, what if I were to tell you all three of them said that Mark Jensen never came to work on December 3rd, 1998? Would that suggest to you that maybe... Well, either all three of them are mistaken or lying, or maybe Mark Jensen didn't go to work on December 3rd, 1998. Is that a possibility? Is it a possibility that Mark Jensen did not go to work on December 3rd, 1998? Judge, I would object. I don't know how this witness can answer that. It's a simple question of whether there's a possibility. I agree. Let's ask another question. Well, we'll get back to this notion that Mark Jensen is an accused murderer. Um, can you see why somebody's accused of murdering his wife sometime in the afternoon of December 3rd, 1998? Would one place him somewhere else on the afternoon of December 3rd, 1998? Judge, I object as to argumentative and again outside that this one. Witnesses. I'll allow you can answer it. Go ahead, doctor. I'd ask the question to be read back to the witness. Sorry, I can't hear through the glass. Oh. Here, just a minute. I'll get you the microphone. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to the notion that Mark Jensen is an accused murderer. In the afternoon of December 3, 1998, would want to place himself somewhere else on December 3, 1998. I suppose. You are aware that Julie Jensen, um, th that medical authorities arrived within two minutes of getting the phone call at 4.31 p.m. on December 3rd, 1998. Were you aware of that? I don't remember the exact time frame that they responded. So if the uh, person who responded, a guy named Dave Wilkinson, a paramedic by the name of Dave Wilkinson, testified that he arrived within a few minutes of receiving the call, um, 
that's neither consistent or inconsistent with your understanding here of the evidence? Would you agree that if Dr. If David Wilkinson testified to that and has records reflecting that, that that would pretty much support the proposition that he arrived within minutes of receiving the phone call about Julie Jensen? Yes. And he testified that at the time he arrived there, there was some measure of rigor mortis that had stepped has set in. Were you aware of that? Yes. And the next day, rigor mortis was largely fully present in the body at the time of autopsy. Were you aware of that? Yes. So the fact that there was some rigor mortis present uh, at the time that the off that the time Dave Wilkinson arrived at around 4:32 or 4:33 p.m. on December 3rd, 1998, that's consistent with her being dead for quite some period of time. Would you agree? Judge, I object. I don't know what quite some period of time means. Well, I'll ask you about that in a minute. Go ahead, ask the question. So I request the question be read back. So the fact that there was some rigor mortis present at the time that Dave Wilkinson arrived at 4.32, 4.33 p.m. on December 3, 1998, that's consistent with being dead for quite some period of time, dead correct? For quite some period of time, correct? Is that true or not? I do not want to comment about rigor mortis because it is very controversial in the literature about timing somebody's time of death by the presence or absence of rigor mortis. And that is something purely in the lane of a forensic pathologist, and I don't want to cross into their lane. Okay. Except when you're rendering an opinion as to manner of death. I would object as argumentative because I don't. We'll think let that one answer. Uh, go ahead, answer that, and then we'll go somewhere else. So you don't want to you don't want to intrude upon their lane, except when it comes to rendering an opinion as to manner of death. So, I don't believe that the manner of death is outside of my scope as a medical toxicologist in this particular case. My learned co-counsel reminded me of something else I should have asked you about, and I'm sorry I didn't I forgot to ask you about it. You were talking about uh, on direct examination, um, defense counsel was asking you about whether or not Julie could have gotten out of bed on the morning of December 3rd, 1998. Do you remember that? Yes. And you, what is your opinion about whether Julie could have gotten out of bed on the morning of December 3rd, 1998? Well, on the morning of December 3rd, based on the stages of ethylene glycol poisoning in and of itself, I don't see a reason why she would not have been able to get out of bed. As okay. far as the other medications that would have added to intoxication, I don't have any reason to believe that she would be incapacitated and comatose by those medications. Certainly intoxicated, not necessarily comatose. So um, you listed uh, the stages of ethylene glycol poisoning. Uh, stage one is, eth EG is, what's EG? Ethylene glycol. Oh, okay. So stage one, that should maybe, oh, it's up here too, EG. So drunk, being intoxicated. Yes. And um, then in stage two, you say acidosis, glycolic acid, pH 7.4 to 6.9, hyperventilate, Oxalic acid, let's see it, calcium, too, too much calcium or something? No, the two plus is the ionic charge on the calcium. Okay, calcium oxalate crystals, kidneys. And then on stage three, you've got renal, renal failure, and bun way up. But you know, I've seen um, stage three of ethylene glyco where the person drops into coma. I mean, no, so nobody in ethylene glycol poisoning, they, they don't drop into a coma? 
Well, a couple things. So the, there was a BUN, which is the blood urea nitrogen, which is a measurement of your kidney function. And that was ever so slightly elevated in her vitreous. And so that indicates that she was not what we call uremic. I believe the number was 20. And so if you have renal failure and you're, you know, requiring dialysis for whatever reason, okay, um, you can develop uremia where your blood urea nitrogen can go above 100. And that can definitely cause some mental status changes. A BUN of 20 is not very high. Now, there are other laboratory parameters that I alluded to earlier today that would help me differentiate a little bit more from stage two to stage three that you can't do in a dead person. So as I said, she was clearly in stage two. There was some evidence of renal tubular destruction, but I don't think that she was very, very far in to stage three because her BUN was 20, which is not really very high. And most deaths are going to occur in stage two because of this calcium, which doesn't have anything to do with being comatose. Now, certainly if there was swelling on her brain and crystals deposited in her brain, there would, reason, there would be reason to believe that she was comatose or if her BUN in her vitreous was in the hundreds and we knew that she was not just in renal failure, but in multi-organ dysfunction, very terminal, terminal stages of stage three, then that might explain comatose. But there's not anything that I see in the toxicology to explain that she would be comatose. You were aware that um, ethylene glycol was found in Julie's liver and in her brain at the time? Uh, uh, I would, let me look at my report real quick. So, on pathological exam, there is just a mention of mild congestion in the liver. And I remember there's something being possible calcium oxalate crystals, but it mentioned out of plane in the section, which makes it questionable whether there was a great deal of calcium oxalate in the brain. But I will say, when I told you that these calcium oxalate crystals go everywhere, they do go everywhere. The question is to what extent, and if they are depositing in parts of the brain that would cause brain swelling and other problems, that could be an explanation of being comatose. So when I've, I mean, I, I haven't studied this the way you have, but when I was reading about ethylene glycol poisoning, and they were talking about third stage, um, Right at the bottom here, they put comatose and then death. So you've never seen a description of ethylene glycol poisoning where the third stage was terminated with um, comatose and then death? You've never seen that? That's not what I just said. No, I, I, so, I'm asking, so you do agree that with regard to stage three, that oftentimes the person becomes comatose and then they die, right? If, if they go to stage three and they haven't been treated, then they will develop multi-organ dysfunction and can develop coma and death. So you do know that Julie Jensen died, and she was dead on December 3rd, 1998, and your, your testimony, your conclusion is that the cause of death was ethylene glycol poisoning, but you're saying she was somewhere in stage two and trending into stage three at the time of her death? 
Yes, what I said was there are three things we know definitively without all of the anti-mortem testing that we would do in a living patient. Number one, she had a almost undetectable ethylene glycol level. That is in the setting of calcium oxalate crystals that were seen in the kidney, so we know that she was at least to stage two. The third thing is that there was some evidence of renal tubular destruction on the autopsy, but as we just talked about, her BUN was 20 in her vitreous, which is slightly elevated. Now, the other way that I would want to know about renal failure would be a, um, a measurement of her creatinine, which if you were to go to your physician, they would measure that. We don't have this, so I can only guess where her creatinine might be, but the BUN is somewhat helpful, and she certainly was not uremic. So we know an almost undetectable ethylene glycol level, calcium oxalate crystals present, some element of renal tubular destruction with a BUN of 20, and she's dead. So my opinion would be that she died somewhere in stage two, most likely because of calcium, which is where most of these deaths occur. So, Doctor, you just said we know, but that's actually what you know, what you believe, right? Do you, what you, it's based on your analysis, and that's what you believe, correct? Yes. Now, um, were you aware of the fact that Mark Jensen um, told Detective Ratzberg and also told Julie's brother, Paul, that on the morning of December 3rd, Julie could not get out of bed? Did he, were you aware of that? Yes. Were you aware of the fact that he had to prop her up in bed so her children could kiss her goodbye? Were you aware of that? Yes. Were you aware of the fact that he told um, Paul Griffin, and I think he also told Detective Raspberry this, that she, she could barely speak, that she was grunting? Were you aware of that? Yes. Well, that's not suggestive or indicative of somebody who could get up out of bed and go on the computer at 9.42 a.m. on the morning of December 3rd, 1998, is it? I don't know. You don't know at the time that Julie Jensen is saying goodbye, that her children are coming in to kiss her goodbye, um, and she couldn't speak to them, she didn't speak to them, and she couldn't get out of bed at that time, and when her husband says she couldn't get out of bed, you don't think that's inconsistent with her going on the computer at 9.42 a.m. and looking up ethylene glycol poisoning? Everything that you just described is a person that may be weak, but not comatose. Do you think that somebody who's somewhere in the first or second stage of ethylene glycol poisoning um, is likely gonna get up at say one or two o'clock in the morning on December 3rd and look up unconsciousness? Do you think somebody might do that? who's suffering from ethylene glycol poisoning? So that's very specific, but somebody that, as I described already, that is intoxicated by ethylene glycol should not be able to not get up and do things. I mean, they may be very weak, they may be very dizzy, they may be still feeling intoxicated. But it wasn't just ethylene glycol, was it? Is it ethylene glycol and ambium and librium? There were other things in her system at the time, right? Right, all of those things that could contribute to intoxication. But also could contribute to her being less able to get up out of bed. And by the way, why, if somebody intentionally on their own took ethylene glycol and librium and zolpidem, why do you think they'd get up at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning to look up unconsciousness on the computer? Judge, I would object. This is outside her expertise. Agree, sustain. Um, do you have a lot more cross, Mr. Jim? No, not a lot more, just a little bit more. We're getting close to our lunch hour. Oh, yes, we are. Just a moment, Judge. Let me confer with my more learned counsel here. There is. One other thing, Doctor, um, again, I'm very impressed with your background and your qualifications. I, I must have, how much, how much did you charge for your 
to, to evaluate this case and then to come in here and testify? Well, the first time I evaluated this case was a number of years ago, and I believe my rate was $450 an hour. And now, um, due to inflation, it's $750 an hour. So how much are you going to build a, build a defense for, for your testimony and for your uh, analysis? Or have you already submitted a bill so I have far? not. Oh, so how much, do you know how much your bill is going to be? It depends on how many more questions you have. Uh, this is, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting hungry, so we're coming to the end here. So I, I'd say maybe two more questions, but uh, how much do you think it's going to be? It will probably be about 10000 to 15000 Okay. That's very reasonable, I think. Thank you so much. No further questions. All right. Are we going to have a uh, redirect? We are going to judge, so we're going to probably have to do that after lunch. We're probably going to have to do it after lunch. It'll be short, but I think that we should take a lunch All right. Break. Let's do uh, yeah. one thirty again, folks. Relax. You, Don't talk about the case. Thank you. You can take the defendant back for lunch. We are in recess.
I don't feel it. We're back on a record on uh, Mark D. Jensen, 2002 CF 314. The appearances are the same. Jury's back in the courtroom. We still have the doctor on the stand. She's still under oath. With that, Ms. Krause, you can start your redirect. Thank you, Judge. Dr. Hale, you testified on cross that ethylene glycol doesn't affect or wouldn't have affected Julie Jensen's mental state in the second and potential third stage. Knowing that, how do you administer somebody Ambien pills? By mouth. And if somebody um, is in their right mental state and you hand them, let's say you hand them an Ambien pill, how does that person take it? If they're in their correct mental state? Yes. They would swallow it. And do people generally use um, liquid to swallow? Yes. And that's typically how a person would take medication. Right. And I think what you had testified to on cross is that when you're looking at some of these other factors, if somebody has taken a whole bunch of pills, because it would be hard to like force it down their throat, um, that's something that you would look at. Correct. Dr. Hill, based upon everything you re reviewed, there's no indication, or do you know if there's any indication that Julie, ja Julie Jensen was taking Paxil or Ambien on the late evening of December 1st, early morning hours of December 2nd? I'm not sure. I can't tell from just looking at the postmortem toxicology what day or time something was taken. We have to get that information from the medical records. Correct. And what we know is that the Paxil was prescribed on the first. Yes. And the Ambien was prescribed on the second. Yes. And if Ambien was prescribed on December 2nd at some point around 11.13 a.m., I think is what Attorney Jamboy said as to when it was picked up, it would seem that she wouldn't have had the Ambien to take at the time the first dose of ethylene glycol was taken. Well, I don't know exactly when the first dose of ethylene glycol was taken, so I can't answer that. So if we take Attorney Jamboy's suggestion that it was sometime in the late evening hours of December 1st and early morning hours of December 2nd, it would stand to reason she wouldn't have had that ambient at that time. Correct. You had testified under, on cross that you didn't have Aaron Dillard's testimony at the time you wrote the report. Correct. You have since had a chance to review his testimony. Yes, I watched it. 
And you understand that Aaron Dillard claimed that Mark Jensen told him that Julie Jensen's breathing was no longer bad. Is that consistent with what we know about the toxicological findings in stage two of ethylene glycol poisoning if an individual is still acidotic? If somebody is still acidotic, then they would be hyperventilating or breathing fast and breathing deep. The word for breathing like that is called Kussmaul, which is K-U-S-S-M-A-U-L respirations. So we see that in diabetic ketoacidosis where they're breathing deep and hard and fast. And so if somebody is acidotic, they would continue to be breathing like that. And that's because they're trying to get that acid out of their system. Right. They're trying to blow off carbon dioxide. And without getting into an extensive physiology lesson about why that works, the idea is that the more carbon dioxide that you blow off, then that compensates for, it does not fix, it compensates for that acidosis. You also know that Aaron Dillard claimed that Mark Jensen gave Julie Jensen a dose of ethylene glycol like we just talked about on December 1st through December 2nd, and then I did a and then an identical dose on December 2nd. Is that consistent with what we know from her toxicological findings? There is nothing looking at the toxicology that tells you how many or when just by that postmortem toxicology. However, if it was a large enough dose on the second or even the third, then we would have a much higher ethylene glycol level present postmortem. And present where? In the postmortem blood. Attorney Jampo has told you on direct that the credibility, I'm sorry, yes, thank you. Attorney Jampo has told you on cross that the credibility of a source of information is essential when making a determination um, as it relates to manner of death. Yes. Um, are you aware of Aaron Dillard's credibility? I am. Is it the job of the medical toxicologist or the jury to determine the credibility of the witness and the witness statements? The jury. Dr. Hill, after everything that you've been told during cross-examination as well as the additional questions I asked, do you have a cause of death um, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty and probability? Yes, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty and probability, the cause of death is ethylene glycol poisoning. And what would your opinion be as to manner of death? The manner of death weighing all things. Remember, it's not my job to determine the reliability or the credibility of certain statements. Like I said earlier, there are statements on both sides. And because of that, my manner of death is undetermined. And there is nothing scientifically or toxicologically speaking, which is what my scope falls within, to state that this is a homicide or a suicide and therefore I say that the manner is undetermined. Or an accident. Correct. I have nothing further. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Mr. Jamboise, do you have any questions? I do. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Hill, um, didn't you just say on this morning, both on direct examination and cross-examination, that the amount of ethylene glycol in the blood at time of death is not indicative of how much uh, or when the person ingested ethylene glycol? Didn't you say that? You are misconstruing my testimony. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So let's, uh, my understanding is that you'd indicated that the amount of ethylene glycol in the blood at the time of death um, could not possibly be indicative of whether it was a homicide or a suicide, correct? Correct. And that the amount of ethylene glycol in the blood at the time of death is not necessarily indicative of how much ethylene glycol was ingested, correct? That is not entirely correct. Okay. Well, you just let's you did just say on redirect examination that if Julie that if Julie Jensen had a had a larger initial dose of ethylene glycol at 
for her initial dose, you'd expect to find a larger amount of thing like all in the blood. Didn't you say that on that, redirect? That wasn't the question that I asked her. Well, that's, then she can say, no, that's not what happened. It's in the area you went into, so go ahead. Did you understand the question I asked you, doctor? Well, I think that there are a couple things wrapped up in your question, and not that I'm reading your mind, but uh, I can revisit the explanation that I gave this morning to perhaps clarify for the jury so that they're not confused. Well, even though this is cross-examination and I, I can ask leading questions, I would like you to do that in a non-leading fashion. Tell the jury about your explanation about the relationship between the amount of ethylene glycol at the time of death with the amount of ethylene glycol that was ingested pre-death. Okay. Would it be okay if I had the microphone back and I can read I'll, get you, I'll even get you the microphone. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this brings us back to this chart that I made this morning. And the question is, just by looking at a level, so let's say at a certain point in time, if I look at a level here. I've got Excuse me, doctor, I've got to get up and... Why don't we, for the record, Ms. Crosby, why don't you say what number this exhibit is that she's talking about? 114. 114. 114. All right. It is. So, when you are looking at a random post-mortem level and you don't know what time we are from death, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. And so just by virtue of what that level is does not tell you when something was consumed or that it's a homicide or suicide. There's no way that you can look at that level and discern in some Harry Potter alchemical way what, what, how that was administered. And so I want to make that clear that there's nothing about that level that tells you how it got there, whether someone gave it to you or whether you drank it yourself. Okay, there's nothing about the intent behind that level. Now, there has been a narrative in this case that because there was a half a teaspoon of ethylene glycol in the stomach, that thus hence heretofore, that was a second administration and therefore it was a homicide. And that is flawed. That is incorrect. And so my discussion was, that if there had been a larger amount of ethylene glycol administered around the time of death, such that there was still ethylene glycol in the stomach, that would have gotten absorbed and would have produced a much more detectable level than what Julie Jensen had. And I'll let you turn it off, too. So, doctor, um, at the time of Julie Jensen's death, she had 55 micrograms of ethylene glycol in her, um, on her, in her bloodstream, correct? 55, 55 micrograms per milliliter of ethylene glycol in her bloodstream that was tested postmortem, correct? Correct. And I would like to say that, that because we deal in medical toxicology with these units in milligrams per deciliter, that is actually 5.5 milligrams per deciliter. And a different laboratory gave it four milligrams per deciliter, which is within laboratory error. So, and you don't have any numbers here, but um, we would say that uh, five milligrams per Liter is that what's five milligrams per liter or five milligrams? Milligrams per deciliter. Milligrams per deciliter. So let's say they'll be right down here somewhere, possibly, right? Almost undetectable. Yeah. Now, um, at the time of her death, correct? Correct.
And you don't want to testify. Uh, you don't. You don't want to offer an opinion as to the time of death uh, because there's such great variation about um, uh, rigor mortis and so forth. But you, we know that she was dead at 4:33 p.m. Yes. So, um, I guess I'm going to turn this mic back on again. You'd also. I don't think your mic is on. Comes, it takes a minute for it to heat up or something. Um, so, you'd also testified about the half life of ethylene glycol in Judge, the human I would body. actually object. This is outside. I didn't ask for it on direct. She's never testified about half-life, and I didn't ask for it on redirect. Well, it's, it's certainly relevant to what I'm going into on recross, Your Honor. We're, we'll let it in. She gave us another explanation on her own. So, that. Doctor, would you agree that the... Um, Are you laughing at my ruling? No, I was thinking of... Thinking of something. Okay. So, Doctor, um, would you agree that the generally in the literature uh, and in your experience that the half-life of ethylene glycol in the human body is somewhere between three hours and 8.5 hours? That's generally what is in the medical literature. Of course, as we've discussed earlier, it's very difficult to get an exact number because it's unethical to perform these kinds of studies on humans. But that's the accepted range in the generally in the middle of medical literature is three to five hours or three to 8.5 hours, correct? Something like that. So, um, Let's say that this dose was administered at 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning on December 3rd, this first, this second dose. And um, so if you had a dose of ethylene glycol that was administered to you, and let's say it's about 30 milligrams, 20 to 30 milligrams of ethylene gly gly glycol. Milligrams or milliliters? Milliliters, I'm sorry, milliliters. Okay. 20, 20 to 30 milliliters. Uh, here, I'll, do you have that uh, thing, Bob? So the top ring on there says 30 milliliters, is that? I believe so, yes. Yeah. And that's, so if Julie Jensen either ingested, well, well, let's say she ingested, either it was administered to her or she drank it herself. She drank a solution that contained anywhere from 20 to 30 milliliters of ethylene glycol at 6.30 or 7 o'clock on the morning of December 3rd. She would have more in her system, say, at 7 o'clock a little bit less at 7.30, a little bit less at 9, a little bit less, and until we got to somewhere around 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock, she'd have less in her system at 2 or 3 o'clock than she had at 6.30 or 7 when it was first administered, correct? Right. Over time, it decreases. Now, and um, some might still be in her stomach because it's still metabolizing out of the system, or would it still all be in her stomach yet, or would it uh, all have come out of her stomach by that time? Well, there can be a remnant in the, the stomach due to various reasons that would cause delayed gastric emptying. So you did testify earlier, did you not, that the, the half a teaspoon in her stomach at post-mortem does not preclude the possibility that she took a single dose of ethylene glycol on the evening of December 1st, 1998, correct? Right. I believe that that very well is a remnant of a prior ingestion. And you just don't know if it was the prior ingestion from the evening of December 1st or from the morning of December 2nd, correct? Correct. Now, you also indicated that um, the amount of ethylene glycol in the blood is not indicative at all of the amount that was ingested at the time of death, correct? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry at the time of ingestion. So the amount of ethylene glycol at the time of death is not necessarily at all indicative of the amount of ethylene glycol that was ingested. Right. It's, it's not very possible to do some kind of extrapolation to this is the amount and this is how much was, was ingested uh, because you would have to know some other parameters like time and things of that sort.
So, doctor, let's say that there's a single dose of ethylene glycol, say 250 milligrams of ethylene glycol ingested. Milliliters or milligrams? I'm sorry, 250 milliliters, uh, 250 cc's of ethylene glycol ingested at 8 o'clock in the morning. And then the person dies sometime that afternoon, 2.30, 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the afternoon. That person dies. You would expect to, you'd expect to find a significant amount of ethylene glycol in, her, in the person's bloodstream at that point? Would you not post-mortem? Well, it depends on a number of things. The absorption of that ethylene glycol from the stomach, and then every person, when you brought up a half-life, the half-life of any substance means that it is the time that ha it takes for half of a substance to go away, to be eliminated from the body. It's just one pharmacologic parameter that we learn about. And so, in general, it takes approximately five half-lives to get to zero. So if we look at something like ethylene glycol, where the half-life is published to possibly be between three hours or eight hours, you are essentially saying it may take Three times five is 15. 15 hours, eight times five is 40, to 40 hours to disappear. That, that's a big difference, which is why this can be very complicated to time backwards. But all of the things being equal, um, the less you ingest, um, the, the less there's going to be left after the five, less, less will be left after three, two to three half-lives, and the more you ingest, the more there will be left after two to three half-lives, correct? Sorry, that just didn't make any sense. Okay, well, let's do it this way. You know, um, I wasn't a... There we go. I wasn't a life science major. But one of my majors was economics, so we did all kinds of graphs as ec economists. So this is, um, in economic terms, this would be like a supply curve, because as the, I'm sorry, this would be a demand curve. As the price goes up, the, the demand goes down, right? And this would be like a supply curve. As the price goes up, the supply goes up. And this point right here is equilibrium. So from an economist, economist perspective, Supply curve, demand curve. And we're looking at EG, we're looking at kind of like a demand curve. So now if there's a, an, ex, an extraneous shift in the availability of a particular item, the demand curve might shift upwards. So then we just have a different curve. We'd, we'd put it in up here. It would look like this. So let's take this and say this is 50 milliliters initial ingestion, and this is 100 milliliters initial ingestion. All of the factors being equal, at this point in time, there would be a less amount of ethylene glycol in the blood, and with a 50 milliliter ingestion, and with a 100 milliliter ingestion, there'd be this amount, right? I don't mean any disrespect, but you have completely lost me. Oh. And how a supply and demand curve analogy applies in this situation really doesn't make any sense. Okay, well, let's take, let's say this is the EG. This is an EG line right here, right? The, e, the amount of ethylene glycol in the blood goes down as time progresses. You would agree with that, correct? Correct. But there's a starting point. So if we start at 50 milliliters, this would be a good way to plot the, the decline of the amount of uh, ethylene glycol in the bloodstream as it's being metabolized, correct? Yes. So if there's 100 milliliters that's initial ingestion, then this would be a good way to designate 
that amount of methylene glycol in the blood as it's being processed out, correct? Possibly. I don't, you're trying to suggest that, um, I'm assuming you're talking about in the same person, correct? I'm talking about the same person. I'm saying all of the factors being equal, that uh, the exact same woman, uh, but one time she's, she has 50, she takes an initial dose of 50 milliliters of ethylene glycol, and then it's measured four or five hours later, or three or four hours later, and then another time she takes 100 milliliters and is measured the same time later, um, you'd expect a lower amount at a 50 milliliter initial dose versus a um, 100 milliliter initial dose. Uh, may I come join you up here? Certainly We're not going to sing a duet, I'll okay? Give, I'll even give you the microphone. Here, here you go. Okay, I appreciate your depiction of this, but this causes me to have to go back to exhibit. Still 114. 114. And what we have to take into account is what, when, so this alcohol dehydrogenase that we talked about earlier is an enzyme that can get saturated. And so depending, it's not just about putting somebody's dose, because presumably if you dump more sugar into a pitcher, you're going to stir it up and get a higher concentration. Unfortunately, we as human beings are not pitchers of water with sugar. We have a bunch of different compartments, but the reason why I spent so much time explaining this this morning was about alcohol dehydrogenase, which doesn't exist in the pitcher of sugar, okay? And so there, this enzyme and its activity plays a role in what that ultimate concentration is. And also that enzyme can become saturated. And so the ethylene glycol would have to stand in line and wait its turn to go through alcohol dehydrogenase, which is kind of what I was explaining this morning. When you add ethanol to the equation, it competes for that alcohol dehydrogenase. So in the world of economics, where supply and demand curves exist, and are probably subject to other factors. It is not exactly a great model to compare in this situation. Yes. Thank you. You, you can return to your seat. So earlier, when you were being asked questions on redirect examination, you made some, you were offering testimony about how the amount of ethylene glycol in one part of Julie's system was inconsistent with um, a certain type of an ingestion. So I guess I missed what you were saying. So maybe you can explain that to me again. Well, I'm not sure exactly what your, what specific conversation we were having that you're referring to, but the punchline of my testimony is that there is a very small amount of ethylene glycol in her stomach. And there, as I was explaining, is a narrative that because that's there, there had to have been an administration of ethylene glycol around the time of death. If that was true, then that level would be higher. Is that what you're asking? I don't even understand what you just got done saying. You indicated that if uh, nobody's talked about an administration of ethylene glycol at around the time of Julie's death. Nobody's talked about that. Um, so I don't know where you got that from. The defense counsel didn't ask you about that, and I didn't ask you about that. There's no suggestion that Julie Jensen ingest, ingested ethylene glycol at about, at about the time of her death. So you understand that. Nobody's proposing that. We spent a good part of the morning hours today discussing that and that ultimately my opinion was that that small amount of ethylene glycol in the stomach was a remnant of a prior ingestion, not a 
repeated ingestion around the time of death. Okay, well, let's, let's define around the time of death. I mean, um, so according to Mark Jensen's confession to Aaron Dillard, well, and we'll quite aside from whether Aaron Dillard's a reliable uh, reporter or not, according to that confession that Mark Jensen offered to Aaron Dillard, the first dose of ethylene glycol was administered in the evening hours of December 1st, 1998. You're aware of that, correct? Yes. And you're aware that according to the confession of Mark Jensen to Aaron Dillard, the second dose of ethylene glycol was administered in the early morning, in the morning hours of December 3rd, sometime before the kids got up, so maybe 6.30 or 7 o'clock. Are you aware of that? Yes. Now, and you are aware that Julie Jensen was found dead at 4.33 p.m., that she was determined dead at 4.33 p.m. by the responding paramedic, correct? Yes. At which point there was some measure of rigor mortis that had set in, correct? Yes. So nobody's proposing that Julie Jensen died at 8 o'clock. In fact, we know she was alive at 8 o'clock in the morning because her son David had told his little friend Eric that mommy's breathing really bad, <gasps> like that. So her breathing at 8 o'clock in the morning, about the time that David was getting ready to go to school, is demonstrates that she was alive at 8 o'clock on the morning of December 3rd, 1998. Yes. And then, according to Mark Jensen's statements that he gave to, uh, to Aaron Dillard, he came back from running some errands, and her breathing had improved. In other words, she didn't, not that she was breathing well, but that she was, her breathing wasn't as bad as it was when he'd left that morning. Um, now, is that a possibility, that somebody's condition could improve all on their own? They could be... That they wouldn't be breathing as, as badly or as hard at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, or at 10 o'clock or 10.30 in the morning as they had been at 8 o'clock in the morning? Is that a possibility? I, you know, I don't know. It's sometimes very hard to translate through different, different people what they're trying to describe was going on. So, but according to Mark Jensen, when he came back, Julie's breathing had improved, and he according to Mark Jensen's confession to Aaron Dillard, when he came back and he found her condition had improved, he was worried about that. He was worried about that. Not worried that she might die, but worried that she wouldn't die. So he rolled her on her side. And then he left her for a while. And then he came back, and she was still breathing. And at that point, he sat on her, shoved her face in the pillow, and killed her. And then he went and picked up his children and ran some other errands. And then he came back at around 4.30 p.m., and made his children wait in the car. Now, there's nothing about this. Is that to argumentative? Overrule, go ahead. There's nothing about that scenario that's inconsistent with what you found by reviewing the toxicological specimens and toxicological results that you've reviewed for this case, is there? Well, you just lift, listed a whole number of things in one question and said it's all consistent. No, and I'm, I'm not going to agree to that. No, I, I didn't. I asked you if any one of those things. Okay, I'll put it another way. So you've testified at great length about the implications of these toxicological findings. Um, and you've concluded to a reasonable medical certainty that Julie Jensen died of ethylene glycol poisoning. You've concluded that, correct? Yes. And you've offered that to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. And what I'm asking you is this. Is the, your findings, the... the toxicological, the medic, medical toxicology findings that you've discussed, are any one of them inconsistent with Mark Jensen indicating that her breathing had approved that morning? There is nothing that I can look at in the autopsy or in the postmortem toxicology that tells me anything about whether her breathing had improved or was worse. There's, you cannot assess somebody's breathing when they're dead. So the short answer to my question is no. There's nothing about that scenario that's inconsistent with the, that. There's nothing in your findings that are inconsistent with that scenario as described by Mark Jensen to Aaron Dillard, correct? That he, her breathing has started to improve, so he rolled her on her side. There's nothing about your toxicological analysis that would be inconsistent with that 
see, uh, th that scheme of events, is there? Well, that's kind of misleading because to suggest that anybody, whether they're a medical toxicologist or not, would be able to look at toxicology findings or an autopsy and be able to tell how somebody was breathing before they died, it's not that it's consistent or inconsistent. It's just not possible. So it's not possible that her breathing had improved? Your question is looking at the toxicology findings and looking at the autopsy, what can I look at in that to tell me whether somebody's breathing had improved or not? And there's nothing that you can look at scientifically to, to do that. And that's exact, I wasn't, there wasn't anything misleading about my question. It's a simple question. And the question is, so there's nothing that you can tell us from the mod medical toxicological perspective that has any influence on the veracity or whether you accept or, or reject the description that Aaron Dillard gave of Mark Jensen saying that when he returned, her breathing had improved. There's Correct. nothing about that. And Correct. furthermore, um, there's nothing about the toxicological analysis that you've done that would in any way, shape, or form affect the reliability of, or in fact, I'll start this question over again because I don't, there's nothing about the medical toxicology in this case that confirms that Julie Jensen, that Mark Jensen did not sit on Julie Jensen, shove her face in a pillow, and asphyxiate her in that fashion, is there? There's no evidence of that. Yes, so the fact that she was poisoned with ethylene glycol and drugged with Ambien does not preclude the possibility that Mark Jensen rolled her on her side, sat on her chest, shoved her face into a pillow, and held her there until she stopped breathing. There's nothing in your analysis that's inconsistent with that, is there? And there's nothing that is consistent with that. Yes, but my question is, there's nothing in there that's inconsistent with that, is there? Correct. And there's also nothing inconsistent with the medical toxicological results that you've testified to that would be inconsistent with Julie Jensen being administered a small dose of ethylene glycol in the evening of December 1st and another small dose of ethylene glycol in the morning of December 2nd, is there? No, you can't tell if it was more than one on that night or that morning. Thank you, doctor, nothing further. Okay, have a safe trip back. You're excused. We have exhibits up there. We, and then we have something by the doctor too, I think. Yes, I'm gonna grab those. But as to 114, my concern is, is that the expert created an exhibit and then Attorney Jambos wrote on the exhibit, so I'm not sure how we differentiate for that for the record. He didn't do it in a different color or anything, so I don't we'll know. We'll figure something out. All right. Maybe he should initial the parts that he did. That's assuming I remember the parts I did. And maybe. I'll, I'll try and do that. I'll try and do that. Draw I'll something see. around where you put your. You didn't do anything on the first page. So page two is the issue. We can do that after. R J J. I hope my economics professor was watching. He'd be proud of me. And this is all R J J. That's not marked as an exhibit. Yes, it is. It's part of the exhibit. No, I moved Exhibit 114 in Attorney Jamboy's before you started to um, do your cross-examination. I think it needs another sticker. Um, so Exhibit 114 is this page and this page? The, the two pages that the expert did, that's correct. Okay. Well, then I'd request that um, this hand you work, because there was testimony that would be marked as Exhibit. It would be 115, Council? 115, Madam Clerk. All right, we have 115 now. All right, who's the uh, defense's next witness? Detective Paul Ratzberg. Seen in evidence. Received. Be 
you could remain standing. <clears throat> you solemnly swear that the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Have a seat. Good afternoon. I just want to make one statement before we start. Um, this witness was here already previously, a long time on the stand. I have about five questions. I understand. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. You gave me the right answer. Okay. You can start. I appreciate that, Judge. Thank um, you. I appreciate it also. <laughs> we had already talked about that, right, Detective Radsburg? Yes, we, we did. Got hours of redirect, Your Honor. <laughs> 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 Yes, this is uh, Julie Jensen's day planner that uh, we recovered on December 3rd, 1998. And I actually opened it up to October 15th of um, 1998. Does that seem right? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I closed it. Oh, that's okay. I'd ask you to open it up to October 15th of 1998. Yes, ma'am. And the first appointment for Julie Jensen on that day, can you tell us what that is? It's got 850 to Dr. Jeff. Dr. Jeff. And did you um, know somebody that Julie Jensen was seen by the name of Dr. Jeff? I do not. Do you know uh, Dr. Jeff Sorensen? No, I do not. Okay. Detective, I'm just going to show you a few pictures and see if these are the pictures, if you can identify them from the crime scene. <laughs> what was previously marked as Exhibit 47. Oh, that's not the one, sorry. Exhibit 46. And I'm going to talk to you just briefly about this glass that I have the cursor on. Yes, ma'am. I know we talked about this when you testified the first time. Can you tell us if you had a chance to um, recover this item for the crime lab? Yes. And the liquid inside it? Yes. I'm going to show you it was previ previously marked as Exhibit 38, and that's the inside of the refrigerator? Correct. And that's what it looked like when you guys took these pictures? Yes. And when you looked inside of the refrigerator, what type of um, juice did you see inside? What's depicted on the uh, picture, quite frankly, there's a, uh, looks like a yellow, or I'm sorry, a red substance that could be some juice, and there's some uh, real juice, uh, some lemon-lime juice in there. So what I can see on the top looks to be some type of maybe tonic? Yes. Water? Yes. Um, a lemon juice? Yes. Maybe some chocolate milk? Yes. And then maybe cranberry juice? Is that similar yes. to what you see? I would agree. I'm going to show you on paper first. Detective, do you recognize those pictures? 
Yes, they appear to be uh, pictures we took on December 3rd, 1998 at the Jensen residence. And the pictures that you have in front of you are the pictures that were taken on that day is what you're testifying to? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 102. Can you tell us what this is a picture of? One of the closets in the Jensen home. Um, do you know from looking at the picture or from your memory whether it ha um, was Mr. Jensen or Mrs. Jensen's closet? Well, from the clothing, I can uh, tell you that it was an adult male or female's uh, clothing. So it would have been Mr. Jensen or Mrs. Jensen's closet. Do you see female clothing in there? And just exhibit 102, not 103? I do not. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibit 103. Do you recognize this closet? It appears to be one of the children's closets. You don't know if that's from the same bedroom? I do not. And what's at the bottom of that closet? Uh, there's some uh, huggies and then uh, well, there's quite a bit of items, a box and some uh, socks and some huggies. Is that a printer box? I can zoom up if it would be helpful. Uh, yes, please. That would be most helpful. I think it says HP laser jet on it. Do you see that on there? I can't quite make out the reading, but it looks like the HP logo on the box. And it looks like a printer on the box. Up just a little bit, please. Absolutely. Yes, yes, you are correct. That is a printer. And when we look at the closet, it appears to have adults' clothing. Oops, I, sorry, I took that off for a second. It doesn't look like children's clothing, does it? Yeah, yeah I would say that clarification is fair. Seems to be maybe some dresses on the left-hand side of that closet a little bit longer down here. Can you see that? I can, and that's why I, anyway, yes. It's easier when you zoom up a little bit to see the clothing. Absolutely. Thank you. Do you know who purchased Julie Jensen's vehicle after she passed away? I believe one of her brothers. Was it Patrick Jensen, do you know? That I don't know. You just remember it was one of her brothers? Yes. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any cross, Mr. Jones? Um, so I have a few. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. McNeil. I've handed you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 117. I'm going to ask you some questions about that in a second. Um, but before that, I just want to show you, um, similar to what you were just asked uh, about Julie Jensen's day planner. So um, if we could have the screen just switched over to this computer. So you just had in your hands the actual physical day planner um, for Julie Jensen, which is uh, was Exhibit 33, correct? I believe it was 33, yes. Um, and so what I'm showing you is on Exhibit 43, which is just the digital version um, of Julie, Jensen, Julie Jensen's day planner. Do you recognize that? I do. And that is, in fact, uh, Ms. Jensen's day planner. Um, so I'm just going to show you uh, a few pages of this. So if we jump to November, November 2nd, I'll zoom in a little bit more so it's easier to see. So do you see there November 2nd? 
you know, if you could just make it a little bit bigger, that would be more helpful. Okay. Do you see the date there? I do, yes. And so, for, exa for example, on that date, she has um, indicated there's something about KYF and Drake. Yes, that is correct. Do you know who Drake is? Drake was the uh, son of uh, Miss Coster, who was uh, Mark Jensen's sister. Um, and uh, you said her name was Ms. Coster. Is that Laura Coster? That'd be Laura Coster, yes. Um, and without talking to me or without saying anything about uh, what was said, did you have a, a conversation with Laura Coster shortly after the death of Julie Jensen? I had a conversation with somebody that identified themselves as Laura Coster. And I take it that was by phone then? That was by phone. That's correct. And you have no reason to doubt that it was her? I have no reason, no. And so was that a repeated event where uh, Julie Jensen would have in her calendar KYF Drake? Yes. And you see in her calendar here, this would be in November, uh, Julie Jensen has the book club? Yes, that is correct. November 10th of 1998? Yes. And then this would be the, the next week. She just made a marking about uh, Mark being in St. Louis. St. Louis. Is that yes. Correct? And then at the very bottom there, we have the repeat of Drake K. KYF? Yes. And then actually, I want to make sure we take a look real quick at November 9th. Do you see there Joe's carpet cleaning? Yes, I do. 2 p.m.? Yes, and it's circled. And now if you look at uh, what's marked in front of you, uh, exhibit number 117, what does that show? That's a receipt for from Joe's carpet service. Uh, located in Kenosha, Wisconsin, to the Jensen home at 9020, I'm sorry, 9002 Lakeshore Drive. I believe this address may be an error. It's uh, actually 9020 Lakeshore Drive, uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, with their phone number. And uh, it's a receipt for some type of uh, uh, cleaning and with a total amount of 4431. And that is from November 9th, 1998? Yes. And then uh, you were asked some, about some appointments that uh, Julie had with a Dr. Jeff. Do you recall that? Yes. And then you see that she apparently has a Mark's appointment for Dr. Jeff here on the 10th. Yes. Now going to um, November 18th of 1998. Yes. And I'll scroll up and zoom in a little bit so we can see that better. There's kind of a lot written on that day, right? It is. So it's conferences, book fair. Do you see that? I do. And then it says uh, at 220, David and Doug to Dr. Jeff? Yes, it does. And then conferences again at 515 p.m.? Yes. And then this day planner, it goes all the way through the end of the year correct? That is correct. And so there's notations in it for um, Julie Jensen's day all the way through the end of December? Yes, that is correct. And so that includes things like uh, there's supposed to be a, a Stiefel Nicholas Christmas party? Yes. Um, so we can see that on December 11th of 1998? Yes. Now, um, you received information that Douglas was going to daycare, correct? Yes. 
Um, and did you actually uh, have a conversation with one of the daycare ladies, Ann Lynch? Yes. And uh, where is that daycare located? It's located in downtown Kenosha, not too far from the courthouse here. Uh, and it's in the what we commonly know as the KYF building. It's adjacent to there um, and by so Library Park. So is that approximately the 5900 block of 7th Avenue? Yes, that would be accurate. And is that uh, less than 10 minutes from the Jensen residence? Yes. All right, and so then the last thing I want to show you is I want to show you some things um, similar to what we're doing with Julie's day planner. I want to show you some things from Mark Jensen's day planner. Um, and so you recall seeing the actual physical exhibit for that when you testified um, several days ago? Yes, I did. Okay, so I'm going to show you an electronic exhibit for that, and this is exhibit 116. Now, I'm particularly, um, and this is a PDF exhibit, so I'm going to say what page it is in the PDF. Uh, I'm going to direct you to page 86 of this exhibit. Do you see there uh, at the top an address? I do. Okay. It's a. Uh, Are you able to read it from here, or do you need me to zoom in? Uh, I can. Uh, let's go with 740 Ford Street, Kimberly, Wisconsin, and above that, uh, underlined is Appleton. And again, this was in Mark Jensen's day planner? It was, yes. And then you see names for several people, correct? I do. Including an Ed Klug? Yes, there's Ed Klug on there, uh, Bonnie, uh, Ron Ruck, Joan, uh, Bill Weiner, and Stacy. All right, and so um, now had you actually, even before the events of December 3rd of 1998, had you actually seen some pages from Mark Jensen's day planner? Yes. In photographic form? Yes. And how did you see that? Uh, those were pictures that uh, Julie Jensen took and uh, handed off to Officer Ron Cosman, and then myself and Ron Cosman viewed the photographs together. And so um, when you actually then seize the day planner as part of the investigation on December 3rd, 1998, did you see again some of the writing that Ms. Jensen had taken pictures of? Yes, I did. Um, but do you recall the picture in particular of uh, a sticky note in Mark Jensen's day planner? I do, yes. And is that shown on the screen here? Yes, that would be the photo from Julie Jensen, and uh, that's what I observed. That's what I observed. And so this sticky note, um, which is on State's Exhibit 15, um, you didn't actually find this when you seized the day planner, correct? It was not in the day planner and when I seized it on December 3rd, 1998. All right, so then I just want to direct your attention to a few other things in Mark Jensen's day planner. Um, and this is on page 115 of the PDF. Do you see here September of 1998? Yes, I do. And it appears in his day planner that he has St. Louis with a star written on September 2nd? Yes, that is correct. And then going to page 116, now we're at September 11th and 12th. He has St. Louis Lighthouse and then Picnic Lighthouse. Do you see that? Yes, that's uh, on the dates of uh, September 11th and September 12th of 1998. And now here at the bottom, we're past now September 26th of 1998, and there's actually no dates here, but do you see these stars? I do, yes. And then at the very last star, do you see the word Appleton? Yes, that is correct. Now going to page 120 of the PDF, um, do you see the October 1998? I do, yes. And then stars for Appleton for the first, second, and third? Yes. It's uh, Thursday, October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd have stars, and then on Friday, October 2nd, 1998 is the word Appleton. And then we have uh, the dates of October 22nd, 23rd, and 24th with the letters SIA. Do you see that? Yes, along with some stars. Or correction, on the 23rd and 24th, there's some stars. The 22nd, 23rd, and 24th have the letters SIA. So 
So then if we go to page 124 of the PDF, do we see the uh, stars and then blueprint on the 5th, 6th, and 7th? Yes, that is correct, along with some times on uh, the 5th of November, 1998. All right, now I'm going to move to page 144 of the PDF. And if we go over to the side here, we see this is November 9th. Yes, it is. And um, on this day, we see the words, there's a few things written, but if we look towards the left-hand side, puked on car carpet over weekend, got into it, whether to clean it up, whether to get it cleaned, I should say. Yes, that is accurate. And that's the same day as the receipt from Joe's? It is, that is correct. Now going to the PDF, page 158. We see some words here, withdrawn, kids, boat, Jelensky, locked chest, crying about miscare. You that is that? accurate. And then going to 160. There's a few words on this page, but we see again the reference to crying about miscarriage. You see that? Yes, I do. And those two pages that I've just shown you, you saw those before because those were in the pictures given to Officer Cosman by Julie Jensen, right? Yes. And then also above that, again, there's a few things on there, but do you see kind of under, I think it, under the word meal, there's something that looks like cruise? Yes, I do. That is jobs. correct. It's spelled uh, C-R-U-S-E. And then jobs quit below that? Yes, jobs quit is right below that with a dash in between jobs and quit. So then the last question I have is, um, without talking about the content of any conversation, on April 21st of 1999, um, you had talked to Mark Jensen. Correct. Um, but that day you also talked to David Jensen? I did, yes. Um, I have no further questions, and I would just move. The only new exhibits are 116 and 117. All right, they'll be received. Any um, redirect? No, Judge, I'd move to um, exhibit 102 and 103, and the other photos had already been admitted. All right, they're also received. Okay. Make sure we got the exhibits. Our next witness uh, is a video, and that's. Um, is it a witness on the list? It's. Uh, it's on the state's witness list, Nathaniel Clanton. Um, I don't have that list right in front of me. I, I'm not sure the number. But we'll get it for you in mere moments. You're saying it's on the state's list? Uh, Ten. All right, I have it. Yeah, how long it is? I think it's 37 minutes. All right. Apologize for breaking your rule again. Madam Clerk, could you see if my computer is turned on? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to start this um, 
and then adjust the volume, and then I'm going to restart it so that we don't blow, anyone ear, blow anyone's eardrums out. By the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, Dr. God. Yes. Thank you. Um, for the record, please state your name and spell your last name. Nathaniel Clanton, C-L-A-N-T-O-N. And you're presently an inmate in a federal correctional facility? Yes. What are you serving time for right now? Uh, crack cocaine. Possession or del possession with intent to deliver or delivery what? what delivery. Delivery of co crack cocaine? Yes. So, President, um, and how much time do you have left to serve in your prison term? Twelve years. And um, so you've been convicted of crimes in the past? Yes. How many times? Ten. How many crimes, I should say? Ten. <clears throat> have you been offered anything in exchange for your testimony in this case? No. Have I talked to you about providing you anything in exchange for your testimony in this case? No. Have you got any time off your prison term? No. Have you been offered any time off your prison term? No. Do I have any authority to provide you any time off your prison term? No. How is it that, um, well, do you know a person named Mark Jensen? Yes. Could you point to Mark Jensen if you see him anywhere in this courtroom and describe what he's wearing? Yes. Okay, point to him, describe what he's wearing. He's wearing a suit. Okay, uh, there's a table to the left of me, and there's three people at that table. Where is he sitting at that table? In the middle. Okay, you're on our custody. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, tell the jury the circumstances under which you first came to see or know of Mark Jensen. Uh, I met Mark Jensen in, uh, in Kenosha County Jail. Uh, I've been in Kenosha County Jail almost six months. I was in J Block with him. And I was I was there for like a month and a half with him. Okay, who was in J Block first? You or him? Mark, Mr. Jensen. So when you first came to J Block, Mr. Jensen was already there. Yes. When you first got to J Block, did you know who Mr. Jensen was? No. And um, once you were in J Block, did you have occasion to speak with him at all? Time, time, not frequently. At the time that you were in J Block with Mr. Jensen, was there a time that uh, Mr. David Thompson came into J Block? Like a month later, after so, me. So you'd been in J Block with Mr. Jensen for almost a month before Mr. Thompson got there? Yes. Now, in the month before Mr. Thompson got there, uh, how often would you speak with Mr. Jensen? Rarely. Not that much. Were you able to observe Mr. Jensen and his interactions with other inmates in the facility? Yes, everybody, pretty much. Be aware of my surroundings. Okay, and did you observe whether Mr. Jensen spoke with other inmates in the facility and in, in J Block? Yes. Um, describe whatever interaction you saw between Mr. Jensen and other inmates in the cell block. Uh, he was he pretty much a, you know, talk about his case with certain individuals, show him his court reports and things like that. Did he ever try to talk to you about his case or show you his court reports? No, I wouldn't want to look at him. Well, I, when you say you don't want to look at it, you didn't want to look I, at it. I wasn't him. interested. No. So he tried to show them to you? And no, he, not offhand, no. He never did? Okay. No, no, no. Um, tell us what happened when David Thompson came into J-Block. Uh, him and uh, Mr. Thompson and uh, Mr. Jensen was... Uh, I don't know, started getting along for what apparent reason, I don't know. They was talking and they started get, you know, getting to know one another, filling each other out. And what I mean by that, they was knowing each other, you know. Um, they had their moments, I guess. So you saw Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson talking with each other? Yes. And when you saw Mr. De uh, Jensen and Mr. Thompson talking with each other, did you see other, any, any other inmates involved in that conversation or was it just Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson? Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson. And um, did you ever involve yourself in those conversations between Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson? No. Did you hear what Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson were talking about? Not really, no. They did used you? to be off to their they was off to their self when they were doing communicate. <clears throat> did you ever come to learn from either Mr. Johnson, other either Mr. Jensen or Mr. Thompson what Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson were talking about? Later on. Okay, who told you about it? Jensen brought it to my attention first. Okay. 
Tell us about that conversation. Did that occur while Mr. Thompson was still there, or had Mr. Thompson left uh, J Block? I think he left J Block. Okay, so tell us what happened after Mr. Thompson left J Block. Um, one day, I, me, and, me and another inmate was in, looking out the window talking, and uh, Mr. Jensen came up, and he was asking me about, uh, about his situation. That Thompson, I guess, had made a um, uh, offer to him, and he had explained to me what it was, and I told him he was stupid for doing it. Okay, what, do it. what was the offer that Mr. Jensen described to you that Mr. Thompson had made to Mr. Jensen? Uh, he can make one of his witnesses disappear. So, th and this is Mr. Jensen describing this to you? Yes. And did Mr. Jensen say anything more about it than that? Tell, tell me, tell the jury if you can, exactly what it was that Mr. Jensen said to you about this discussion. He was, uh, Mr. Jensen was explaining to me that him and uh, Mr. Thompson was talking about a witness, a particular witness that was on this case that lived in another, another county outside of Kenosha. And I guess, from my understanding, that um, the witness had testified against him and um, got his bond or something revoked from him to come back to jail. And I guess he was mad about that. And the way he was explaining, like he was a, a major factor in his, in his case, because if he came, if the individual came the first time and, and testified on him that he had come again today or whatever, and do the same thing. So I guess I guess he was explaining that to Mr. Thompson. And Mr. Thompson brought an offer to him, was stating that, well, you give me his name and where he stayed, you know, I'll make something happen. I'll make him disappear, or whatever. And after that, he left. He had Mr. Thompson had left and went to uh, went to uh, Chicago to take care of his his business. And Mr. Jensen came up and talk, asked me about it, and I told him he was stupid if he do it. Because I, I didn't think that was cool of doing that. If you feel you got confidence that you can beat your case for Aaron Square, why would you need somebody to take a witness out? To, you know, to make now, did Mr. Jensen respond, if at all, to your, to your um, advice? Right. I, I hope he did. Um, did you have any further conversation with Mr. Jensen at that point? No. Did um, you and Mr. Just excuse me, just hold. On. Now, when Mr. Jensen was describing this, um, pre these previous discussions between himself and Mr. Thompson, um, did, it, did he give the impression that he'd made up his mind one way or another as to what he was going to do? Yeah, I think he did. What, did, what was it, was it your impression he made up his mind that he was going to do? Yeah, he might have gone, uh, take up uh, Mr. Thompson's offer, because the way he made it seem like Thompson knew what he was doing. Well, tell me. Mr. Clanton, what was it about the statements that Mr. Jensen was making to you that caused you to believe that Mr. Jensen was seriously considering this offer that had been put to him by Mr. Thompson? Because Mr. Thompson and Jensen was always together the, the week, the couple weeks that they were, that he was there, and they was always together talking by themselves. There was never nobody around when he was talking. And then after Mr. Thompson had left and Mr. Jensen was speaking to you, mm -hmm. what was it about that conversation? What was it about the things that Mr. Jensen said in that conversation that caused you to believe that Mr. Jensen was seriously considering this offer from Mr. Thompson? Uh, he was pretty much like he, uh, he had second doubts about it, about his, about his situation. About the case or about, about the case. offer? About his case. 
Were there any further discussions that occurred between you and Mr. Jensen concerning Mr. Jensen's case after Mr. Thompson had left? No. Did you ever see Mr. Thompson intimidate or threaten Mr. Jensen? No. Did you have the impression Mr. Jensen was afraid of Mr. Thompson or anybody else in the cell block? No, not really. I don't think he should have been afraid of nobody. It didn't seem like it at the time. I heard, I don't know, I heard, but I'm not going to say. Well, if you didn't see something. I can't speak on that. Mr. Platt, I'll just tell you, because in court, if you didn't see it or if you don't have first-hand knowledge, I'm not going to ask you about it. All right. So from your first-hand knowledge or from what you observed, you never saw any evidence that Mr. Jensen was being threatened or harassed or intimidated by Mr. Thompson or any other inmate in the J block? No. And you were there for about how long a period of time with Mr. Jensen? Like a month and a half. Now, during that period of time, did Mr. Jensen strike you as being very reluctant to share his case or share details of his case with other inmates? Yes. He was reluctant to do that or he was willing to do that? He was willing to do that. Okay. And so did you see him talking about his case with other inmates? Yeah, numerous times. Can you tell us some of the other inmates that you saw him talking to? I don't know, like last names that they had, aliases that they was using in there. Okay, well, tell us the aliases if you know. It was one, there's one name that says we call him Ben Latin because of the way he looked, which is crazy. But he was sharing his information with him. You know, he'll break out with his paperwork and show him and he'll read it, you know. Then he'll talk about it and I ask him a few questions about it. And then it was a couple. You asked him a few questions about it? Ben Latin. Yeah. Okay. And then it was a couple more times that a couple of other individuals, they just came in like weekend warriors. You know, they're there for the weekend and they go home. And he was showing them his information with him, his paperwork and everything with him. And that was it. People that was coming in. Okay, thank you. I don't have further questions, Mr. Clinton. All right. Mr. Jamie. Mr. Clinton, you indicated that you're serving a federal sentence right now? Yes, I am. That was, you were convicted on one count of distribution of crack cocaine, right? Yes. You were charged with another that was dismissed as part of your plea agreement, right? Yes. And they had evidence that you had distributed crack cocaine on a number of other occasions, right? Yes. You indicated that you have about, I think you said 12 years left on your sentence? Yes. Now, my information was that you had been sentenced to 212 months and that was? 17 years. Just about a year ago? Yeah. And how do you come up with the 12? You do 85% of your time. And that's what the calculators come to, 13 years. With the time you've done and your sentence credit and the good time, you figure you have 12 left. Yes. But you're hoping not to serve all 12, right? If it's a new system, I mean, if it's a, hopefully, hopefully something goes for this crack law thing, yeah, I'm hoping I can do it. Well, you're also hoping that your testimony in this case will help you go below 12, right? Yes. Your lawyer, Mr. Lieberman here, he's here to help follow up on that, right? Yes. And you've also, why were you in the Kenosha County Jail? Because I had some other federal affairs I had to take care of that pertains to my case. Federal charges against you? Yes. You had other federal charges? No, no, sir. No, I had no other federal charges against me. You were in Kenosha so you could cooperate against other people, right? Yes. And because you know that you can go back to the judge and ask him for less time by cooperation, right? Yes. And you want to use that cooperation and the cooperation in this case to try to reduce your sentence, Mr. Clanton? Yes. And you know that the only way that you can help yourself is by helping the prosecutor, right? No. 
Well, if you if you helped Mr. if you helped Mr. Jensen, I couldn't I couldn't go to the judge and ask for less time. That wouldn't get you anything, would it? No. Right? You agree with that? Yes. No. Okay. Uh, you have you have ten prior convictions. Yes. Your first conviction is for an armed robbery. Is that right? Yes. And then you've had a number of uh, battery cases. Yes. You had a uh, you had a case involving an Erica Jones, right? Yes. You broke in her door. Yes. You punched her in the nose, breaking her nose. Yes. Alice Jones said she was going to call the police, and you said you'd kill her if, you, if she called the police. No, I called out. During that same incident, after you broke the door and broke Erica Jones' nose, you don't recall telling Alice Jones that you'd kill her? No. Are you saying it didn't happen, or you just don't recall? I just don't recall that part. Was Alice Jones there? Yeah, her mom was there. And then uh, Erica Jones' child was there as well, right? Yeah, my son. And uh, uh, and he also was hurt in this incident, right? Not that I know of, no. Well, do you recall kicking a bassinet over and knocking uh, your son to the ground, causing causing some bumps? No. Are you saying that didn't happen, or you just don't recall? It didn't happen. You remember being charged with that, though, right? Yes, a battery. And by the way, when you were sentenced to 212 months, by, is by Judge Shabazz in Madison. Yes. And the prosecutor was only recommending 188 months, right? Yes. And Judge Shabazz went over what the recommendation was, correct? Yes. And that's something judges can do in the federal system, is they can go beyond what the prosecutor recommends, true? Yes. And that's what happened, that's what happened to you, right? Yes. And then, and then there was a, uh, a LaShawn Sheldon, remember her? Yes. And you beat her too, right? I beat her, no. Well, do you remember having an argument about what she was wearing? Yes. You said, if you want to dress like that, I'll treat you like one? Yes. And you grabbed her by the shirt, right? Yes. Took her in the bathroom? Yes. Grabbed her on the neck? Yes. Choked her? No, I ain't choked her. While choking her, you said, I'll do anything I can to kill you? No. Tried to punch her in the right side of her neck? No, I No. I don't recall all that. That was in your pre-sentence report in the federal case, wasn't it, Mr. Clanton? I didn't, I probably didn't read that part. Most of the things in my PSI I didn't even pay attention to. Well, you were asked if there was any corrections you needed to make in that pre-sentence report, right? Yes. And you didn't have any corrections, true? Yes. And you had indicated that you went through that with your lawyer, true? Yes. Um, Mr. Clanton, um, you said Mark Jensen talked about his case with other people, right? Yes. And he showed him, for example, some police reports, right? Police reports, some of his, his uh, also some uh, documents uh, that to read, that pretty much you can read his file. He had his file in there. He had like stacks of files in his, in his cell, right? Yes. Lots and lots of papers. Yeah, he had two bins full, yeah. I mean, like a couple foot high stacks of papers, right? No, there was two bins full. Yeah, what's a bin? Uh, like a foot tall, foot high. Right? Okay, so you had a couple feet of, of papers, right? Yes. And uh, 
And when he'd show people his papers, he'd, he'd say, basically, this is crazy, right? Explain his side, side of the situation, yeah. Right. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with telling people you didn't do something or explaining why the reports are messed up, right? You're right, right. Except that it's not very smart to do when you're in a jail, is it? No, it's not smart. Um, and you know that if you talk about your case with people, that someone may use it against you, right? Yes. And when you say use it against you, they may take information they get and then twist it and add some lies and then use it against you, right? Yes. You're aware of that ha kind of thing happening? Yes. It happens quite a bit, doesn't it? Yes. And you're also worried about having your papers taken and looked at even if you don't show them to people, right? Um, yeah, 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 you're right, yeah, yeah. Because if somebody reads those police reports and then they know the names of a couple of the witnesses against you, well, all they have to do is just add a couple of little lies to it and it looks like you're confessing to something you didn't do, right? Right. And I think uh, another thing you've mentioned is that uh, if you just kind of tick somebody off, they may use the information they got from you against you, right? I guess. I mean, like if you, you refuse to share your lunch with them or fail to share canteen with them, they may respond by saying, I'll stick you, right? If you're intimidated by them, I, yeah, I guess. Well, <clears throat> you recall telling the, um, you were, you had a recorded interview, right? Yes. Okay. And you recall saying at that time, this is, this is page four, um, if you don't treat them right, meaning someone else who you've talked to or whatever, basically it would be like canteen floating around and you ask for something and you say no, then they like, okay, you want this all to get out? And you pretended to write something down and then send it in. I mean, you were just, you were explaining that if you turn down somebody for canteen they're demanding, they may, they may turn against you with the information they have, right? So can't, no, I, I can't agree with that one. So what you saying is, is that it's like I have a thing is you treat you give people respect, you get respect back. Now, as far as somebody just like, okay, you don't give me no canteen when I ask for it, or you don't give me nothing off your tray, okay, I I got something for you. That's stupid. That, that's okay. seriously that's stupid. Well, I'm just looking at what you had to say in your recorded interview. Right. Uh, That's what I meant by that. I mean, which one is that? Because what page number? Page four. You don't have I'm sorry, and do you recall saying that about the canteen and you've just changed your mind or or you think that no, I just the misunderstood? Canteen situation, yeah, misunderstood because okay. what I meant by that but is like you treat people with respect, people will respect you. Okay. But as far as taking somebody it's my you offer somebody ask like, man, let me get a candy bar or something and you tell me no, okay, no it's no. But in some and some other people don't look at it like that though either. There are some people who take no for canteen with respond with a punch in the face or something. That or or probably like you say, uh write a note in or something. No, so they, they may try to set you up for something if you don't give them canteen. Yeah, they do that too. But you think the greater danger would be that if you share share your information with somebody that they can use it against you to get themselves a deal. Yes. And so you thought that was pretty stupid of Mr. Jensen to let people look at his stuff? Yes. <clears throat> you indicated, Mr. Clanton, that you did not hear any conversation between Mr. Thompson and Mr. Jensen? No. Yes, yes. That's correct. Um, 
Did you see Mr. Thompson shove or hit Mr. Jensen? No. I take it that could happen at some point without you seeing it? Yes. Well, you ain't paying attention to it or whatever situation occurred, huh? You came in on August 16th, is that right? Yes. And when you came in, did you right away hear about an altercation that had happened the day before in that J block? No. You didn't hear anything about two guys beating up Michael Clark? No. And you think Mr. Thompson was there for two weeks with Mr. About two Jensen? weeks. Yeah, about two weeks. In J block? Yes. And your understanding was that to get rid of a witness, uh, Mr. Thompson's offer was $100,000? Yes. And uh, Mr. Jensen never told you he accepted any offer, right? Thinking about it, that's what he said. He was talking to me. He was on my side when he was talking to me, when he and when he approached me about his situation, because I was talking to another individual. We were just discussing other things, and he came 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 approached me and was asking me about it. Was that other individual there? Yes. Who's that? His name Bernard Bush. And I'm sorry. What was the first name? Bernard. Bernard Bush. Okay. And he simply told you that Mr. Thompson had approached him with an offer, right? Yes. And he hadn't done anything about it, right? Not right then and there, no. And it was $100,000? Yes. Now, do you recall what time of day Mr. Thompson came into the cell block? It's like after lunch, like around <coughs> about 1 30, 4 to 2, somewhere around there. And then he left for a couple days uh, soon thereafter to go to court in Chicago? Yes. And then he came back for a day? No. He stayed a few more days, then he left again. And then he didn't return to J Block? No, he was in a block next to us. And was it a few days before Mr. Thompson and Mr. Jensen talked, after Mr. Thompson arrived? No, probably, probably a day later, like the next day. And was it after Mr. Thompson had been there for almost two weeks that you had this conversation with Mr. Jensen? Excuse me. Was it after Mr. Thompson had been there for a couple of weeks that you had this conversation with Mr. Jensen that you were telling us about? Yes. So after like two weeks time of watching them, that's when Mr. Jensen told you this? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Clanton. That's all I have. You said that when Mr. Clanton came back, um, he was in the next cell block over? You mean Mr. Thompson? I'm sorry, Mr. Thompson. You're Mr. Clanton. I'm sorry. When Mr. Thompson came back, he was in the next cell block over? Yes. And what separates the cell block that you were in from the cell block that Mr. Thompson was in? Uh, glass and wall. So you were, able to see Mr. you were able to see Mr. Thompson? Yes. And um, did... What, is there any way for inmates between the two cell blocks to communicate with each other? Yes. Tell, describe the ways that you've seen inmates co co communicate with each other between those two cell blocks. Uh, you can talk through a heater. It's a, like a heater that runs across the wall under the window. A heater? Yes. Okay. And you can talk, you can talk down to it to hear and communicate or whatever, or you can write notes and put them on the, wall, on the window and show them so they can read it. So you've seen inmates do that? Yes. Tell me some of the inmates you've seen do that. Uh, I see, 
uh, seen Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson done it. Okay, uh, did you, you, so you saw Mr. Jensen, Mr. Thompson communicate in which way? Either through the heater or by holding up notes on the side? Holding up notes. Did you see what the notes were or what they were talking about with each other? No, not at all. But you did see Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson communicating with each other by holding up notes to each other? Yes. Um, did you ever see or hear them try to communicate to each, to each other by talking through this heater duct that you talked about? No. And over how long a period of time was it that you saw Mr. Jensen and Mr. Thompson communicating with each other through the two cell blocks? Uh, about a week later. Now, the, when you had this discussion with Mr. Jensen, when Mr. Jensen started talking to you about this uh, planned uh, or proposed abduction of the witness against him, yes. uh, was Mr. Thompson still in the cell block or had he left the cell block by that time? He left the cell block. Did Mr. Jensen ever explain to you how this plan was going to unfold if Mr. Thompson was locked up? Apparently, if it would have took place, uh, Thompson had some people out there that he, I guess he said he did. That was going go to go to Alberton. That was going <coughs> to pick the individual up. That was going to take him to a house. That was going to put him in a basement or something like that. And it was going to keep him there until the, until the court case was over with. You know, was, this is what Mr. Jensen told you? Yes. Did you ever discuss with Mr. Jensen the feasibility of just holding somebody in the basement of a house until the trial was over? I told him it was the dumbest thing if he ever done. Thank you, Mr. Clanton. I don't have any further questions. Mr. Uh, I'll be in everything that Mr. Jensen was relating to you was Mr. Thompson's statements, right? Right. That was what Mr. Thompson was proposing, right? Yes. And would it be fair to say, Mr. Clanton, that uh, many inmates in that J block were talking about Mr. Jensen in this case? Probably who he talked to, yes. He only talked to us a lot of few when he felt like talking to him. Who would you uh, talk Excuse me. I'm, no, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Uh, when he, when he feel like talking to a select few people, he'll go talk to him. But other than that, like people that come on the news, they'll try to, you know, talk to him. He'll talk to him back. Then, you know, he feel he got a friend there and they get to talking and things like that. Everybody knew who he was, right? I guess, yes. And what his case was about? I guess. People would I talk mean, about it when it would be on the news? I mean, watch the news. Not Wisconsin news, no way. He was always watching like Channel 9 news, uh, Channel 7, anything that was Illinois related. The majority of everybody there was from Illinois. And weren't there newspapers in the jail? Yeah. That in the Kenosha news? Yes. And people would talk about Mr. Jensen's case being in the news? No, nope, we wouldn't get the paper. Right. He'll had, he had tear it out before we get the paper, whatever he had in there. Yeah, you because he was the only one getting the paper. Yeah, excuse. He would show it to people, right? Not the papers, not his newspapers. After fact, after he get to read his newspaper, he'll let you read the paper. Okay, then people would read it. Then people would read it. All right, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Clinton. You said there were a select few people that Mr. Jensen would talk to in the cell block when you were there. Yes. Who are the select few? Uh, Mr. Bush. Uh, that's Bernard Bush? Yes, sir. So would you say that he spoke to Bernard Bush more or less often than he spoke with David Thompson while David Thompson was in the was in the cell? Less. Which inmate, while you were locked up in the same block with Mr. Jensen, which inmate did Mr. Jensen talk more to than any other inmate in that in that cell block? Mr. Thompson. Which inmate did Mr. Jensen speak with second most often besides, or most often besides David Thompson? Uh, Mr. Bush. Uh. 
And which inmate did Mr. Jensen speak to besides, which inmates, if any, did Mr. Jensen speak to besides David Thompson and Bernard Bush? Me. Now, aside from those three persons, David Thompson, and Bernard Bush, and yourself, did you ever see Mr. Jensen talk to any other inmate in the facility? That was it? That was it. Everybody that was there before. It, I mean, it, that block changed, you know, like every couple of days. And the ones was there, you know, we was the ones, uh, Mr. Jensen, Bush, and myself, we was there the, the longest. And then new people started coming in. Did you ever see Mr. Jensen speaking to the new people about his case? Yes. So he did speak to other inmates? Yes, he did. Was there any other any other inmate that he spoke to on a regular basis besides the three names that you just mentioned? Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know their last names, though. But yeah, it was. It was a couple more. Do you remember which cell number you were in while you were in that in the cell block? One. Do you remember what cell block Mark Jensen was in when he was in that cell block? He was in cell block two at first when I first got there. And then they moved them to cell cell six. Do you remember what uh, cell David Thompson was in? Four. Do you remember what cell number Bernard Bush was in? Four. Thank you, Henry, for the questions. Well, Mr. Clanton. Basically, you're saying you talked to a whole lot of people. Yes. New people, right? Mm -hmm. Yourself, Mr. Bush, Mr. Thompson, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Bin Laden? Yes. Uh, is, that, is that Mr. Otero? Yeah. Yes. Do uh, you recall Mr. Campbell, who was there when you first arrived? Camp. No. Camp. But you, don't, you wouldn't recall everybody's name from the time you were there? That'd be fair to say. Pretty much. Somewhere. I mean, you're talking about new guys who come in or go. If somebody was there just the first week you were there, you may not remember that, right? Right. Yes. And I take it you weren't, you didn't have a timer or anything to try to determine who Mark was talking to the most or what was going on, right? Timer. A timer. No, 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 no. Timer. And you noticed this because the whole time he was talking to people, you were thinking, what a fool, right? Yeah, I was thinking worse than that, though, but yes. Yes. You thought it very foolish to, sh to share what he had with people, right? Yes. All right. Thanks. Take a break now. Let's take our afternoon break, folks. Please don't talk about the case. try to break up the videos and play one this morning and the other two short ones this afternoon, but obviously we weren't able to do that. So the other two are shorter, but they're this afternoon, and then that's all we have. Until all right, tomorrow. we'll try to get them in. Okay.
We're going to bring the jury out. Jensen, 2002, CF314. The appearances are the same. Jury's back in the courtroom. We are on the uh, defense's case. Who is the next uh, witness, Mr. Perry? Judge, well, before we do that, I, I want to put on the record um, the video that we just saw of Nathaniel Clanton's testimony has been added to Defense Exhibit 104 along with the transcript, and I'd move that into evidence. All right, that will be received then as part of 104. The, um, the, defense, the defense's next witness is another video, and it's um, Joanne Wise. And what number is it on your list? Thirty-two. All right. And judge, we have two videos, but they're both short. And by short, I say fifteen minutes. What's your definition of short? I think they're about 15 minutes. That is a good definition. <laughs> All right, this let's do the first like one. This one looks like it's 1456. Thank you. Uh, state your name and spell your name for the court. Joan Wise. Wise is W-I-S-E. Ms. Wise, what do you do for a living? I'm retired now. Prior to retirement, what was your occupation? Um, I work for Secure Insurance. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I work for Secure, Secure Insurance. How long had you been with Secure Insurance? Five years. It was at approximately, what, 2001 or 2002? 2002, November 2002 till November 2007. Seven. Yeah. So you, you just retired a couple months ago. Right. Um, do you know a, a man named Ed Klug? Yes. Did you ever work with Mr. Klug? Yes, I worked with Ed for 10 years from November of 1991 to May of 2001. Where were you working with Mr. Klug in November of 1991? Robert Baird. How long did you work at Robert Baird with Mr. Klug? Seven years. So from 1991 until 1998? That's correct. Uh, what was your relationship to Mr. Klug in terms of uh, working? He was a stockbroker and I was his assistant. You personally were his assistant? Yes. For that entire seven years? Yes. While you were at uh, Baird, did you also work with a man named Ron Ruck? Yes, I did. Did you also work with a Stacy Bauer? Yes, I did. In 1998, uh, did you have a change in your career path? <clears throat> October 1st of 1998, we left Baird and we went to open an office of Steeple Nicholas. And, and where, well, first of all, where were you working in Baird? What city? Appleton. And where was the office for Stiefel Nicholas that you opened in October of 1998? It was in Kimberly. Is that sort of suburban Appleton? Yes. <laughs> who, all, who all joined the uh, Stiefel Nicholas firm from Robert W. Baird? Uh, myself, Stacy Bauer, Bonnie LeClaire, Ed Klug, and Ronald Ruck. Who was in charge of that office there in Appleton? Ed was going to be the manager, but Mark Jensen was our manager until Ed got licensed. How long did that last? I don't recall. A couple months, maybe. A, a short period of time? Yeah. Uh, was, was Mr. Klug the the branch manager himself, or uh, was it, it was a, it was co the co manager. Both Ronald Ruck and Ed Klug were co managers. 
Uh, did you did you ever meet Mr. Jensen? Yes, I did. How many times? Once. And when was that? When we went to open up our office, he came to help Ed and Ron with the transition from Baird to Stiefel Nicholas. <laughs> would, that have been, would that have been like the first week that you opened up the office in Kimberly? It was the first day. So after Mr. Jensen was there the first day, you never saw him again? No, I did not. So you, he wasn't, fair to say, he was not much of a hands-on manager for those couple months? Um, I didn't even remember that he was the manager until the hearing when you brought it to my attention. I remembered that we had to mail forms for him to sign. On a day-to-day -day basis, were uh, Ed Klug and Ron Ruck making the decisions as to how the business was run? I don't know what they what their decisions were and what decisions they had to go to Mark for. Okay. At, at the time, were you uh, aware of Mr. Jensen participating at all other than signing some paperwork? I knew that he was just going to be the manager until Ed got licensed. Now, while you were while you were there and employed at Stiefel Nicholas, what was your work relationship with Mr. Klug then? I was his assistant. And were you did you remain his assistant from October nineteen ninety eight until you left in two thousand and one? May of two thousand one. So then so you were Mr. Klug's assistant for about ten years total. That's correct. Um, did you ever have any conversations um, with Mr. Klug about Mr. Jensen? Um, no, I just remember one conversation. Okay, and what was the conversation that you recall? Um, a couple months after we opened up the office, he came out into the area where all the assistants sat, and he said that um, he just heard from Stiefel Nicholas in St. Louis that Mark Jensen's wife had died and that she had committed suicide. And when you say he, you were talking about Mr. Clue? Mr. Clue, yes. Did he announce that to your entire staff? Everybody but Stacy, because Stacy was the receptionist and she was up in the front of the office. We worked in the center. Okay, so he announced this to all the people who were in the center of the office. Yes, Bonnie and myself, yes. Uh, did he say anything else about Mr. Jensen and his wife at that time? Not to me, no. Um, did you ever hear him say anything about Mr. Jensen or his wife at any other time? Not that I recall. Did Mr. Klug ever say anything to you about Mr. Jensen talking to him about Mr. Jensen wanting to kill his wife? Ed never told me that, no. Is that something that you would have remembered if you... If you Absolutely. And no such conversation ever took place? No. Now, uh, did you ever receive a telephone call from a Detective Ratsburg? Yes. Did you, and let me just make sure I'm, I'm correct. Did you, talk, did you talk with him on the phone? Or yes. Only? Did you ever meet with him? No. When you spoke with him on the phone, did he ask you if you'd ever, ever had a conversation with uh, Mr. Klug about Mr. Jensen? I can't remember what he asked me, to tell you the truth. Well, did it relate to Mr. Yes. Jensen? Yes. And uh, did you did you tell him uh, that you didn't recall any conversation with Ed Klug about Mr. Jensen wanting to kill his wife? That's correct. That's what I told him. And that was truthful when you told him that, yes. correct? Now, when you spoke with Detective Ratsburg, did you tell him that there was another person who had been trying to reach you? Yes, I told him... Um, a gentleman by the name of Santo had left a message on my answering machine, and he and then the the policeman said, "Well, you probably won't want to talk to him." Okay. Did he so say, I didn't call him back. So you didn't call you didn't call Santo back. That's correct. Uh, and that was based on the policeman's advice. Yes. Did you ultimately talk to Santo? Yes, he delivered a subpoena to my house for the hearing. And did you have a chance to speak with him at that yes, time? Yes, I did. 
Have you spoken with him since that time? Yes, he's just told, kept me informed on when I would need to come to the trial. And is, is, is his name Santo Galati? Yes. And has Mr. Galati been pleasant with you? Absolutely. And you're saying the reason that you didn't call Mr. Galati back before he came with the subpoena was because of the advice of Detective Ratsburg? That's correct. Now, during the uh, during those 10 years you worked as Mr. Klug's assistant, <coughs> did you have a chance to get to know him pretty well? Yes. Uh, during that time, were you able to form an opinion as to uh, Mr. Klug's character for honesty? Yes. And uh, what was your opinion as to his character for honesty? Um, he wasn't very truthful. And during that, during those 10 years that you worked with him, were you aware of what his reputation within the office was uh, as to his honesty? Yes, you couldn't believe a word he said. And uh, would you characterize Mr. Klug as an attention seeker? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Wise. That's all I have. Ms. Wise, uh, Mr. Klug, uh, at one point during the course of the time that you worked there, it required you to go to anger management counseling. Is that correct? That's correct. And then ultimately he fired you? That's correct. And uh, did that make you feel angry or resentful toward him? Um, a little bit at the time, yes. Now, um, do you remember where you were located? Do you remember how you heard about the news that Mark Jensen had been arrested and charged with the murder of Julie Jensen? I think the first I heard of it was when the policeman called me. You don't recall um, Ron Ruck and Ed Klug discussing this in the office after Mark had been arrested in front of all the ladies that worked in the office? No, I don't recall that. Do you recall Ron Ruck ever telling Ed Klug in the presence of uh, the clerical staff that was assembled there that if he knows anything about the death of Julie Jensen, he should come forward and tell the police about it? No, I don't remember. I don't recall ever hearing that. You say that um, you remember, however, Ed Klug coming out and announcing to you and to the other clerical staff that uh, Julie Jensen was dead, that she committed suicide? Yes, he had just received a call from the home office in St. Louis of Stiefel Nicholas. Do you remember Stacy Bauer's reaction to that news? Like I said, Stacy wasn't in the area I was. She sat up front, so he, after he announced it to us, he went up to, fr up to the front of the office to talk to Stacy. And of course, I sat in the back by his office, so I don't know what he said to Stacy. Oh, well, I didn't, I, I, you didn't say that here, so you must have said it some other way. I didn't know about that. Okay. So um, you and Stacy Bauer sat in different places. Absolutely. What about Bonnie LeClaire? Where did she sit? She sat right in front of me. So if uh, Bonnie LeClaire, you and Bonnie LeClaire would have been told at one point and then Stacey Bauer would have been told at a different point? Yes. Now, would that have been the case also when uh, Ed Kluge came back from uh, the Stifle Nicholas Blueprint in November of 1998? Would, uh, would what have been Would the seating arrangements have been the same? The same? I'm sorry. Would the seating arrangements have been the same? When, yes. So uh, unless there was a... Unless Stacy made a specific point to come back by you two, or you two have made a specific point to come up by Stacy, uh, otherwise any conversation Ed Klug would be having with you, Stacy Bauer would ordinarily not hear it. That's correct. But Bonnie LeClaire probably would. Yes, because he would stand right between Bonnie and I. Now, you said that you were present when uh, Mark Jensen came down in order to assist in uh, opening up the Stiefel Nicholas office? That's correct. Do you remember Kelly Labonte being there as well? Yes, she was somebody that was sent to us from St. Louis to help the girls transition into the office. Now, did you have any impression as to how much uh, help or how much work uh, Mark Jensen and Kelly Labonte actually provided to you during the transition period of time? Um, they helped us with forms. You know, we had a big mailing to do. Other than that, I don't know what Mark helped the gentleman with. Did you uh, notice anything going on between Mark Jensen and Kelly Labonte? It was pretty obvious. Okay, what did you what did you see, and what uh, th that caused you to come to this rather obvious conclusion? Um, looks, 
um, time spent together. They went and got the food for us when we had to eat. So your impression was that they were having some kind of a relationship? It appeared that way. I didn't discuss it with anybody, but that's how it appeared to me. Now, did Ron Rock ever talk to you about the circumstances surrounding Julie Jensen's death? Not that I recall. And you don't recall Ron Rock and Ed Klug ever sitting, standing in front of you and Bonnie LeClaire and Ron Rock telling Ed Klug, if you know something about this, you should come forward and tell the police about it? No, I'm, I don't recall that. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Wise, you were asked some questions about if Mr. Rock or Mr. Klug said something to uh, other employees after Mr. Jensen was charged. Do you recall just being asked that? Um, Mr. Jensen was charged in March 2002. Were you working at Stiefel Nicholas at that time? No, I wasn't. And so, it fired me in May, May of 2001. So it would be pretty unlikely that you'd hear a conversation in an office where you didn't even work, wouldn't it? Exactly. Um, why, did, why did Mr. Klug fire you? Uh, he got mad. I um, had an abscess tooth. I had made an appointment to see the doctor. But before I had a chance to go into that appointment, in the middle of the night, my tooth acted up. So I called in sick because I had to stand by for the endodontist to be um, free to call me in whenever he could get me in. And Mr. Klug wanted me to come into the office. And he called me like four times that day saying, you have to come in. And I said, I can't and I have sick days and vacation days coming. And I didn't go in. And then at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he called me and he said, you won't ever be coming back in here. Now, you gave some opinions. Uh, you gave an opinion that Mr. Klug was not a truthful person, correct? That's correct. Uh, was that your opinion before you were fired? Yes, it was. And did that remain your opinion after you were fired? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Anybody need to stand up in the jury for a moment or anything? No? Because I'm going to stand up. <laughs> Your Honor, while you're standing, uh, I do believe we need to ask that Exhibit 94 be accepted into evidence. That was the letter from Attorney Craig Albee to Mr. Jensen that was testified about yesterday. I don't remember that. I don't remember that either. Yeah, that would have been on Tuesday. Was, was that with uh, when his staff member was here? Correct. All right, it'll, it'll come in. Thank you. Okay. Who's our next witness, Mr. Perry? Number 19, Marvin Oakler. All right. Spell your last name for us. Okay. Uh, Marvin W. Eckler, O-E-C-H-L-E-R. And everybody might be able to guess this, but let me ask you what you do for a living. I'm a retired uh, uh, Lutheran clergyman. You're a, a pastor? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> where did you grow up, uh, Pastor Eckler? In Kenosha. Where did you, where were you a, a, a pastor? Where was your career? Uh, I graduated from Northwestern Theological Seminary in Minneapolis, and my first call in 1961 was the Two Rivers. 1966, I came to Kenosha, St. Paul's Lutheran Church. How I long spent were you? 29 and a half years in there. You were at St. Paul's Lutheran Church for 29 and a half years? Yes. 
What have you, and did you retire at that, that I point? I retired in 1995, and I worked part-time as a visitation pastor now in Owatosa in Church. What else have you done since your retirement? Uh, basically, you worked uh, as, as some interim, ministry, interim ministries in, um, in Kenosha and Wind Lake and in Kenosha again. Different churches there. Do you know Mark Jensen? Yes, I do. Do you know Mark Jensen's family? Yes, I do. How do you, how do you know the uh, Mark Jensen and his family? Well, um, Mark's father was on the call committee when I was called. And so I met uh, Daniel Jensen at that time, back in 1965. And then he came to Kenosha, and um, uh, the Jensen's um, used to pick up my children to take them to Sunday school because we only had one car at the time. And uh, so it was, I got to know them quite well at that time. You said that Mr. Jensen, Dan Jensen, uh, that's Mark's father? Yes. He was on the call committee? What's a call yeah. committee? Co call committee is a group of uh, men and women who um, will go to a church and uh, listen to or, or to interview the pastor of that church, which happened to be me at the time in Two Rivers, to see if they would wanted to call me to their church in Kenosha. And so it's a group of men or women and women that uh, are, uh, that will go to different places to interview uh, prospective pastors for their congregation. It's sort of the hiring committee for yes, the church? we call that a hiring committee. You mentioned that the, the Jensen's would take your kids to Sunday school, I, I take it because you were otherwise occupied on right. Sunday mornings? Mm -hmm. Yes, I was. You came to Kenosha or returned to Kenosha in 1965? 1960, January of 1966. So did you meet Mark Jensen around that period of time? Yes, I did. How old was he at then? Mm -hmm. Let's see, about uh, seven, six or seven? Well, I think about seven years old. Does uh, Mr. Jensen have a sister? Yes, he does. Who is that? Laura. Laura so, um, Coster. Did you know both Mark and Laura as they grew up then? Yes, I did. Did you know uh, Julie Jensen? Yes, I did. When did you meet uh, Julie Jensen? Probably about the same time, or shortly thereafter, in, in, during the early part of 1966. How is it, and I take it Julie Jensen also would have been a, or she would have been a young girl at the time? Yes, yes she was. How is it that you came to know uh, Julie Jensen? We were neighbors. We lived, our, our house was almost abutted on the back. Your backyards were against each other? Not, not really. They, they, she was a little bit west of our backyard, but it was an open field at the time. Was her, was her name at the time Julie Griffin? Yes, it was. Did you know the Griffin family? Yes, I did. And because they were neighbors? Yes. And at, because we uh, did things through PTA, we, we, we attended PTA meetings and things together. Were your children uh, similar ages to the Griffin ch uh, kids? Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, I, I, if I'm, like Julie, I think was one year old and my one daughter, and uh, and the boys were the youngest boy. I think is about the same age as my oldest, my youngest son. Um, so it, they were comparable ages, maybe a year or two off. But did you were you aware of any particular problems within the Griffin family? Well, I was aware that they had lost a younger brother, or an older brother, at, at, before we got there. At some point you realized that Mark, Mark, and, Mark Jensen and Julie Griffin uh, were close? Yes. At some point you learned that they were going to be married? Yes. Uh, did they ask you to preside over that Yes, marriage? they did. Do you recall when that was, Pastor Eckler? Was it 1980? 1980, 81, right, it was the late, uh, either 1980, in that area. I can't okay. remember the exact date. Uh, there, are you saying the early 1980s? Yes. And did you, in fact, marry them? Yes, I did. 
Uh, did you attend the rehearsal dinner? Yes, I did. Uh, was there anything notable about the rehearsal dinner? This is, Mrs. Griffin got sick. Okay, and, and can you tell me what happened? She uh, she just sort of passed out or, or went into convulsions and was taken to the hospital. Was that the night before the wedding? Yes, it was. Were you aware of what that was caused by? It was from alcohol. The, um, <clears throat> did you, uh, did Mrs. Griffin attend the wedding? No, she did not. Did you see her on the wedding day? Yes, I did. I went to the hospital to visit with her. And who else uh, accompanied you? <clears throat> Just myself. Did you see, um, Mark and Julie on occasion during the period of time they were married? Yes, I did. Did you ever have any occasion to counsel them during the period of their marriage? Yes, I did. And uh, what brought on that, that counseling and, and when? It was in 1980, 1980, no, it was when, 1991, when she had the, when, when she, when I was called by her. And what prompted uh, Julie Jensen's call to you? There was problems in her marriage. And was there anything in particular happening at that time? Not at that time. And how did you handle the counseling issue? Talked with the, both of them, and then I suggested, urged them to go to see a marriage counselor. Why did you refer them to a, a marriage counselor? Um, because I felt they should have further counseling and something that I could not provide for them. I knew my limitations, and I decided that they should go on. Were you aware of any affair at that time? Yes. And what, what did you know about that? That she had seen another man. Was that one of the issues that related to the counseling? Yes. <clears throat> Pastor Eckler, you learned at some point that Julie Jensen had passed away, is that right? I, I did. Can you tell me how you how you learned of her passing? I received I received a phone call from Florence Jensen, uh, stating that's, that's, that's Mark's mother. Mark's mother, stating that Julie had died, and would I come over? Was that on the day of her death? That was on the day evening of her death, the day of her death. And what did you what did you do then? I went to the house and uh, talked with them and uh, stayed with them till probably ten o'clock. Whose house did you go to? Uh, Florence Jensen, to Florence and Dan Jensen's home. Do you know what time that you arrived at the home? I would say I got there around 6 p.m. Who was at the Who was at Florence and Dan Jensen's home that evening? Um, Florence and Dan, um, Mark, um, the um, Laura was there, her husband. And I think the children, if I remember right, the children were there too. Did you have a, a chance to observe Mark's demeanor that evening? Yes, I did. And how would you describe that? He was very upset, at, and I feel distraught and con concerned as to what happened, concerned that he couldn't get home to be at his house, wondering why the district attorney was at the house. Um, there was just a number of things that, that, I, uh, that were uh, this, uh, I, I, things that were um, of concern to him. Did you offer him counseling? We talked for a while, but well, I'm not counseling that evening. No. Did you Did you see him a, again during the course of the next several days? Yes, I did. And could you tell me about that? I saw him on the, the day of the of the uh, with the wake on was that Sunday and got there prior to visitation with the family and we had prayer together. And then I stayed through the, through the, uh, the wake that evening, so, the visitation that evening. So you met with Mark at the, at the funeral home prior to the time that the, the wake began? Yes. 
Do you know how long you spent with them that day? Prior, let me say prior to the, the wake? Probably about 20 minutes. And we, had, who, we had a little who, prayer service together. And then who was there? The immediate family, uh, which would have been the Jensen's, and if I remember right, the Griffins were there. The Griffin boys. What was Mark's demeanor at that time? I think he was grieving. I believe he was grieving uh, over the loss of his wife. And did you have a chance to observe Mark at the wake? Yes, I did. Did you believe that he was acting appropriately there? I would think he was acting appropriately. Everyone acts differently, but so what is appropriate at a wake? But I, I thought he was acting appropriately. At any time, did you see him act in a way that you thought was inconsistent with grieving? Not that I noticed. And it, was there any occasion in which you saw him, or that you recall, in which he was, was laughing? Um, there could have been, but I don't remember seeing him laughing. Okay. If there had been some laughing, would you view that as, as inconsistent with the grieving process? No. Now, I take it that a regular part of your role as a pastor over the many years that you've, that you've been a minister is to help people uh, who have a loved one who passes away. Yes, yes. You've been involved in thousands of those occasions? Now, probably about, uh, probably about nine or nine hundred to a thousand. Is that how many funeral services you think you presided yes. over? Yes. And even sometimes when you're not presiding over a funeral service, they'll come to you for support? At times, yes. Uh, do you, in your experience uh, as a minister, are you often the first person that uh, will be seen to, to look for support? Many times, yes. And during those those 900 to 1,000 funerals that you believe you've presided over, is sometimes is there laughter? Yes. Why why is that? Is is that not inconsistent with grieving? I don't believe it's inconsistent with grieving. I, I think there are times when uh, something comes up and you laugh about uh, something you did together, or, so, or a person brings up a memory and. It, you laugh about it, and it's not done in bad taste. It's done in, as, as a part of the grieving process. Do you ever try to include some levity or humor in the words you speak, the sermon you give at a funeral service? Yes, I do. Do you believe that that's somehow some measure of disrespect for the person who's passed away? No. And And... Why would you why would you put humor in a service like that? Well, it, it, if it's done in good taste, I think it, it helps it helps relieve some of the tension of the funeral. And have you seen occasions at a at a funeral where a, a good friend of uh, say a, a person whose spouse has passed away, where a good friend will try to release some tension on their own by telling a joke or remembering some humorous past event? Yes. Based on your experience uh, over the years with, with many grieving people, do you do you feel that there's a single way in which people grieve, Pastor Eckler? No, I don't. There's a variety of ways. I may elaborate. I had a family who, a young boy of 12 year old, died of cancer. He'd been sick for a couple of years. And, and at the funeral at the church, we started off with, because he had a piano player, a pianist that he knew, uh, we played something from him which was not religious at all. And we started the service with uh, on Wisconsin, which uh, because he was a, he was a fan and he, he got to go to the games a number of times because of his father, grandfather. 
And, and so we, we started the service with that, which some people may think would be sacrilegious, but, but I felt it was a good way for the family to, to be able to um, grieve a little bit easier that we could do that. And at all times, uh, your observations of, of Mark Jensen at his parents' house on the night of his wife's death and at the wake and service you felt was appropriate? Yes. There was nothing that you recall that you thought in any way was any measure of disrespect for his wife, Julie? No. Thank you, Pastor Eckler. Mr. Jemmes. <laughs> And oftentimes, uh, Pastor Eckler, when we're talking about a funeral or a wake, really you try to transform it into a celebration of the decedent's life, isn't that? Many times you do, yes. And um, did Mr. Did Mark Jensen talk to you about ways that maybe he could transform this wake or this uh, funeral into a celebration of Julie's life? We talked about what we were going to do at the funeral, uh, in the service. As did, did he discuss with you the advisability of bringing his girlfriend to the wake? No, he did not. Did you know that he had a girlfriend in the months preceding his wife's death? No, he did not. Did, oh, fine. did um, he ever, d did you ever meet Kelly Jensen, the woman who became Kelly Jensen? Yes. Did you preside over their married wedding as well? I had a blessing of their marriage. So did either Mark or Kelly tell you when they met? No. Did they tell you that they met when Kelly was engaged to Mark Creeman? Judge, no. These, these questions are irrelevant as uh, to this witness. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that this witness is, uh, these are other than argumentative with this, with this witness. They're, oh. not going to, they're not going to uncover Hold someone on. who have. Thank you. Um, Pastor Eckler, in the, in the grieving process, can you conceive of a circumstance where it would be appropriate for the grieving husband to high-five his father the day after the wife, his wife's death? What happened with the circumstances? Object. Uh, the, uh, That's an argumentative uh, and not relevant as to this witness. Uh, Sustain. No further questions. Thank you, Reverend. Any questions? No. You may step on. Thank you. Is that an exhibit number we can move in now? We're going to add it to exhibit <laughs> 114. Four, Judge. All We're right. going to add all three videos to that exhibit, and we don't have any other witnesses today, Judge. And that's our last video. <laughs> our the, last video. For the day? No, that's the last video <laughs> at all. <laughs> As of right now, all the rest of our witnesses are live. All right. <laughs> but they won't be here till tomorrow. <laughs> all right. I, I take it then we don't have any more witnesses today, correct? That's correct, Judge. All right. 8.30, folks, don't talk about the case. Have a good evening. Hold them. He's going to have to stay for a minute. I'm, I'm holding a jury for a few minutes. I just want to discuss. Um, does the defense have their witness list in front of them? Um, I do not judge. I can get All right. It. I'm looking at um, number 18 witness, Ann Lynch. She was called by the state. You're not going to recall her, right? Correct. And then I'm looking at number. You want me to tell you who we plan on? 31, David Wilkinson. You're not going to recall him then, right? Correct. All right. So tomorrow. Give me the number, uh, which number of witnesses are you going to call? Right now the plan is to call three witnesses, and I will try to find their numbers. All right. 
long Lindsay Thomas will take. She's going to be the first witness, Judge. And what number is she? Number 28? What number? 28. 28. So she'll be first. Yes. And then we plan on calling Laura Coster, and she's number 16. 16. And we right now intend on calling Ronald Rock. He's number 33. So the only expert tomorrow you're going to have is Dr. Lindsay Thomas, right? Correct. And we're going to start out with her. Yes. Okay. And then on Monday, just so the court knows, um, we have um, Pam Dreyer. Uh, let me She's get number the... eight. Monday, okay. And then we have um, Miss uh, the expert, um, Dr. Sarah West. She's number, number 30. 30. Okay. And then David Jensen is number 13. Okay. Unfortunately, they couldn't change their travel plan, so Monday's as soon as I can get them, Judge. Okay. So, Judge, um, we're almost certainly going to have some rebuttal, so we're preparing to have that Monday afternoon if those witnesses are done or Tuesday. All right. It's going to depend on how long. It depends long how long the attorneys ask questions. Correct. <laughs> and I'm not making any I wouldn't answer that question. I'm not making any representations. All right, Today. take them back. Today. 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 Not anymore. I'm done making representations. <laughs>